It's the tenth episode of the MMA Roundtable. Thanks for joining in. Uh, today's December sixth. Got a bunch to talk about. A lot of news came out today, actually. Uh, you had the Ronda Rousey announcement. She'll be defending her belt at UFC 157 in the main event against Liz Carmouche. Dana White and the UFC making a controversial decision, saying that George St. Pierre's next opponent will be against Nate Diaz. We got UFC on Fox 5 to break down this weekend. Let's do it. <laughs> Once again, thanks for tuning in. Uh, it's the MMA Podcast and MMA Mental together in a beautiful, beautiful union for the MMA Roundtable. Uh, our uh, buddies Patrick and Ray from MMA Mental, our buddy Buffalo Dave, and we have Ramses joining us later on, uh, a little hungover, so he couldn't join us from the top of the show. Obviously, you can listen to the MMA Roundtable every Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Uh, next week, definitely uh, keep keep tabs on us. We're either going to do a Monday show or we might just need to skip next week due to, due to some scheduling difficulties. So follow us at the MMA Podcast on Twitter. We'll keep you updated on that. But after next week, we'll be back every Thursday, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Uh, and I'll pass it off to Ray to get a little plug action on for MMA Mental. Brilliant. Thanks for that. We've had, we, me and Patrick uh, recorded last night's MMA Mental. We had two two great guests, so you can you can check that out now. That's on on the website, or it's also on iTunes as well. We spoke with uh, two uh, two top UK lightweights. We had the number one contender for both Bama and KSW lightweights, which was Kurt Warburton, who actually went one and two in the UFC. Uh, and then we also spoke with Tough Smashes contestant, which was nice. It was good to get uh, one of the guys on, and they, uh, after having such a good show in on the show. We spoke to Brendan Lochnane and he was it was really good speaking with him. And it was his birthday yesterday as well, so it was nice that he came on and spoke to us on his birthday. Also, we did our first series of Fight Diaries last week and we, we, we featured Spencer Hewitt and that went down really well. But next week I'll be doing a, a, special, a special show as I'll be teaming up with the Bellator heavyweight finalist Rich Rarebreed Hale, which, is, which I'm really excited about. And we'll be getting down, uh, getting down and dirty with Rich in his preparation for his, his big fight next Friday. So obviously... You check that out as well. Awesome, yeah, I'm going to be tuning into that for sure. Um, our podcast, the MMA podcast, every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Man, we had an amazing interview yesterday. Definitely check it out. Uh, throwing it up on iTunes, actually, as we speak. Wasn't able to get it up last night. Uh, in both senses of the term, um, the internet was was down, so I wasn't able to get it up. I wasn't able to get the podcast up. It was sad. But luckily, the internet was up long enough to get that awesome interview. Uh, we actually had Nate Corey on for an hour and a half, and he covered everything from being a part of the Jehovah's Witness group uh disenfranchising himself from all his childhood family and friends uh what it was like coming up in the ufc had some uh had some hateful words for that punk front row brian uh it was it was honestly truly my my favorite podcast so far or my uh, favorite interview so far in our 23 episodes um i'm going to be putting just the clip of the interview up on youtube uh so definitely check it out i mean it was really really worthy of the hour and a half listen and uh yeah if you'd, you'd like to join in on the the conversation we already got six voices so i don't know if uh calling in is necessarily the best idea but if you tweet us we'll definitely read your tweet live on the air and our twitters are you uh can tweet me at the ma podcast or if you'd rather tweet somebody who is British and has a silky smooth voice, then uh, probably tweet MMA Mental, because my voice is not silky smooth, nor am I British. Um, also visit the MMAPodcast.com. And uh, before we get on to the MMA topics, Ray, you want to tell us the answers to last week's uh, Fight Busters, along with give us this week's Fight Busters? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we didn't have any winners last week. We'd like to keep it, keep it, uh, keep it hard. Keep the questions hard. So, uh, as always, <laughs> by UK. Are you laughing you, at me? You said keep it hard. You're a bonehead. You're the bonehead of the week. <laughs> so, as always, Fight Busters is sponsored by UK Fightwear. Uh, and as we didn't give a prize out last week, so the, we'll give the prize out this week instead. So, it is a nice blue, uh, blue dethrone hat. 
last, I'll give out last week's clues. They're, they're all cryptic clues and give you the answers, and that'll kind of give you uh, an idea of how I'm thinking. And I'll give out this week's clues as well. So uh, last week's clues were number one was the giant champion. Uh, the giant being Andre the Giant, and if you're a champion, you're a winner. So the answer was Andre Winhouse, the former uh, the UFC fighter and UK lightweight. Uh, the next one was the burping key. Uh, burping being Boucher, a type of key being Allen. So you had Allen Boucher, uh, and the pit with a fence was the third one. Uh, the pit, thinking of the, the actor Brad Pitt, uh, and a type of fence is a picket fence. So you had uh, you had Brad Pitt. Pitt. So that, that's you. That's, what you've got to think like you've got to, to get into into my mind so this week clues are there's a common common theme for all of the of all the fighters this week that are, are the answers to the clues all the fighters are on either UFC on FX6 or Tough 16 finale and obviously UFC on FX6 which is basically the Tough Smashers finale so all the guys that are the answers to this are all going to be on one of those two cards which is obviously course, both happening not this weekend the weekend after so the first clue, number one, is a rubber sleeping in a car. The second clue, number two, is singing in Brazil. And the third one, the third clue, is ha- has to be a female playing on the swings. That's the three, cu- uh, three clues. Hmm. Well, I, for the life of me, can't think of what any of those would be. Uh, we'll definitely bring you back Fight Busters at the end of the podcast and let Ray reread them uh, just to refresh your mind. If you think you have the answer to those, tweet Ray at MMA Mental, or if you prefer an American who sounds like an autistic lesbian, then tweet me and I'll forward them on to Ray. Um, yeah, let's let's get to to mixed martial arts. A ton of stuff to talk about. Uh, we had a bunch of fight announcements this week. Unfortunately, we had a couple injuries as well, and we'll get to those injuries first. Uh, Forrest Griffin out of UFC 155. This car has really been savaged by injuries. You have Chris Weidman out. You have, uh, who else? Gray, Gray Maynard out. Now you have Forrest Griffin out. Um, it was originally supposed to be Griffin versus Sonnen. Sonnen pulls out. Now Griffin pulls pulls out. Um, not really sure when Griffin's going to be out of the event or how how long he's uh, going to be sidelined, rather. Uh, he tore his MCL, sprained his ACL, had 20 cc's of blood pulled out of his knee. And now the the uh, kind of question on the uh, table is what happens now for Phil Davis? All the top light heavyweights are sidelined, um, or either sidelined or already matched up with a fight. You know, you have a lot of these big 205-pound matches made for this month, January, and February, Really, there's no answer if 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 you want to put a top light heavyweight up against Davis, it's not going to happen at UFC 155. So what what should happen now for Phil Davis? Do you put in another kind of lower ranked light light heavyweight up against Phil Davis? He just had two fights against Wagner Prado, who I don't think anyone really was up to his caliber. Do you give him another punching bag? Or do you just pull him off the 155 card and wait to see what happens the next couple months with a lot of these light heavyweight matches? Um, personally, I think you pull him off of the the card just just because he's 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 punched enough punching bags. It's about time he gets a real good opponent. Whether that's the winner of uh, Bader versus I think Bader's fighting Matt Matt Yushchenko next month. Uh, who and Gustafson obviously fight each other. Uh, on Saturday, uh, what do you guys think happen? What do you guys think happens next for Phil Davis? It's a it's a tricky one because you've got to look at it from Phil Davis's point of view, and he's obviously put the training and he's preparing for this fight. And of course, if he doesn't fight, he doesn't get paid. So, for his from his point of view, would you rather fight a can and get paid, or would you rather not fight and not get paid? Now, if I'm Phil Davis, I'd rather fight a can uh, and get paid, uh, and I think that's probably what will happen. It's such a it's it's such a shame. The division at the top is very very good, but you know probably below the top ten or top fifteen, it's not a very deep division. So it's such a shame, really, with with the injury. Uh, looking at maybe who you could throw in if you did want to get a replacement, it's always hard get a replacement late notice. But the only guy I can think of who who's not uh, teamed up with or not paired up with someone is Thiago Silva. Whether that's a fight people would want to see, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 a really difficult one to say. So I. I think what will happen is he will stay on the card 
and he'll just fight somebody who'll be a pretty straightforward fight for him. Um, I think that the best thing to do is give him a top level guy, and most guys at light heavyweight are uh, signed up. You got Bader taking on Matt Yashenko. We got Gustafson and um, and uh, Shogun coming up this weekend, and we also have Machida versus Henderson. I think the fight that makes the most sense would be Phil Davis to take on the loser of uh, Machida and Henderson. That makes the most sense to me. Yeah, I think um, you could keep him on the card. There's already a guy com- campaigning on Twitter to uh, take the fight, and that's um, Vinny Megalis, who uh, someone was suggesting yesterday. I don't know if it was someone in his camp or it might have been uh, MMA elite from someone from there um, bringing it up. But then today he tweeted himself that he would definitely take it if uh, given the chance. I think it'd be a good fight to see. Um, don't forget, Phil Davis is only one win away or one win since that loss to Rashad, so it's not like he's just breezing through competition. Um, so taking another fight against a lesser, you know, lower tier opponent wouldn't be that bad for him. Help build his name up again and get him a possibly give him a top, you know, top five opponent for his next fight if he takes takes on someone at one fifty five and wins. But you know, the drawback too is if he loses by some, somehow, then you know, his stock falls a little bit and he's back to square one again. So it's a tough decision, but I think he should still take a fight. Yeah, I think Phil Davis should definitely look to take a fight. Like you guys mentioned, most of the top level guys are already signed up with, with other matches. Um, be that as it may, Phil Davis certainly deserves top level competition. He's, he's shown that in his tenure in the UFC thus far. I think, um, but be that as it may, you want to stay active. You don't want to get rusty. And, you know, part of being a great fighter is winning the fights you're supposed to fight. Um, or, you know, winning the fights you're, you're supposed to win. Um, when, when you're a, a top-level guy, you know, you shouldn't come out looking as tentative like maybe Phil Davis did in his fight against Wagner Prado. Um, so be that as it may, I think I'd like to see him take on maybe someone like a Ryan Jimmo. I haven't heard anything about him. I don't know what he's doing right now. Uh, he looked pretty dang good in his uh, seven-second knockout over Anthony Paroche. Made a nice debut in the UFC for himself. Um, so I, I think it wouldn't be such a terrible mismatch. And, um, you know, got to stay active. I'd like to see that happen. Definitely, yeah. Um, <clears throat> sounds like we have some differing opinions there. But Davis, obviously one of the top contenders in the 205-pound division. Uh and really young guy too, so he'll he'll be clamoring for that title for a long time. Uh, speaking of UFC titles, man, you you know I I really don't don't like Dominic Cruz much. I'm not much of a fan of his fighting style, but you gotta feel for for the guy. Uh, he's been out for a year now with a torn ACL, um, and now it turns out that his body and this is such a bizarre story. His body actually rejected the cadaver ACL that was put into his knee and he was training and apparently uh, just some some light pressure put against it and it pops. Uh, He's going to be sidelined another six to nine months. Came out with a video explaining it. Teared up in in the uh, video which, you know, obviously a real emotional time for the champion and it looks like Henan Barrow will be defending that interim belt against uh, Michael McDonald. And kind of, you know, I was uh, curious. Henan Barrow... In the UK, yeah, and uh, Ray, I uh, believe you have and tickets, I'll, I'll right? Go to the event. That that's uh, really believe, awesome. I believe, I believe I've got two tickets today. <laughs> yeah, Ray, Ray will definitely be watching. Unfortunately, I don't know how many Americans are going to be able to watch because they put it on Fuel TV. But um, aside from the uh, card, you know, I think a lot of people thought Hennen Burrell was going to be Dominic Cruz's stiffest competition. He is a monster striking, a great grappler as well. Um, Dominic Cruz him, himself, amazing record. I think he's 19-1. and one. He's avenged his only loss, um, almost GSP-esque. Obviously the most dominant 135-pounder we've ever seen. Do you think Dominic Cruz is going to be back with the same dominance he had before? I don't think so. Chris? Um, man, yeah, that's a, that, that's a great question. Uh, it, who knows, right? With the right rehab, the right technology, the right doctor, they can do as good as they can for you. But uh, seeing how his body rejected it, obviously something went wrong, either with his medication or just uh, you know with his training. 
will he be back with the same dominance? That's a great question, man. I, I can't answer that. I, I think judging by GSP's performance, I would have to say no. I don't think he's going to be as mobile and active. His entire style is based around uh, lateral and uh, lateral movements as well as uh, – you know, uh, kind of uh, ducking and uh, diving and juking, and I don't think he'll be able to do that with a bum knee. So my money's on no. He won't have the same dominance, and especially against guys like Mayday and and Burrell, it's just it's going to be a world of hurt for the guy. I could actually see him coming back and getting finished, to be quite honest. Yeah, um, uh, it's a tough question. Um, you know, we've seen GSP do it. But GSP didn't have as near as much trouble as uh, Cruz is going through. Uh, GSP's injuries seemed to run rather smoothly. He didn't seem like he had any setbacks. But now Cruz, he's having major setbacks. Um, you know, like Chris just brought up, that's his whole style is moving, 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 moving. Um, it's going to be hard for him. Uh, he might have to reinvent himself as a fighter and come up with a whole nother game plan and fighting. Uh, time will only tell. I personally don't think he'll be the same. Yeah, I I don't know that he'd be able to come back the same. If he is, I don't know that he'll be able to show the same level of of performance that he has. Like we saw with GSP, he was able to get it done against Condit, but he came in with a significant amount of ring rust uh, just due to the amount of of time away from the cage, if nothing else. So that's going to be a huge factor for Cruz. I mean, we're looking at a potential two-year span by the time he gets back inside the cage, and and that's huge. I mean, he's still a young champion, but at the same time, that's a a critical piece of his prime. And he was really looking uh, like he was picking up steam. He had just defeated Dominic or Uriah Faber, the one guy to beat him. Uh, He made easy work of Demetrius Johnson, really, handing him a a, a very good loss. Um, So it's hard for me to believe that he'll come back to form at least right away. I think we could have a situation um, potentially like a GSP Sarah where he could come back, he could get finished, and potentially make his way back to the title. Um, at the same time, yet yeah, there's a chance he can come back and similarly to GSP, um, come back from his ACL injury and uh, defend his title. Hopefully uh, that's the case, but he does have some pretty stiff tests waiting in the wings for him in the form of uh, Hennon Burrell and Michael Mayday McDonald. This is uh, interesting because it's, it's kind of like the same uh, situation we had a few years ago, going back quite a few years, with, with Frank Mayer. Now, he was obviously UFC heavyweight champion. He just uh, fought Tim Sylvia and snapped Tim Sylvia's arm in like 30 seconds. And then he had an accident and he smashed his leg up on a motorbike. And then when he came back, uh, he was off for a long time. So the championship went to interim and then eventually, because he was off for so long, they gave the championship. They, you know, they worked out and someone else was champion. And when he came back, he'd come back, and it was, everyone was excited to see Frank Mayer back. And his first fight back was against a guy called Marcio Cruz. And he just didn't look the same. He got uh, Marcio Cruz literally broke, split him open with, that, with elbows and cut him to pieces. They ended up getting knocked out, knocked out uh, after that by Brandon Vera, and then had a very sloppy win over a, uh, a guy called Dan uh, Christiansen, who wasn't very good. But then you look at Frank Mayer now, and he's back, back to his best again. So I'm thinking, will Dominic Cruz come back? I don't know whether uh, how bad the injuries. I don't know a lot about uh, the, the like the medical stuff. But m- my question to y- to you guys is: regardless of this injury, if Dominic Cruz hadn't had this injury, do you think Dominic Cruz would have beaten Henan Brow? And I actually don't think he would have done. So I think regardless of this, whether he had this injury or not, I think Henan Brow is going to take that title, and I think Henan Brow is going to go on to be the most dominant bantamweight champion. Definitely, uh, Henan Brow is a top. Top 135 pounder. Even without this and the injury, he gives Dominic Cruz a lot of problems. And, you know, really, I do hope he comes back 100%, because that's a fight I think we all want to see. A 100% Barrow versus 100% Dominic Cruz. Um, Man, what a what a freak freak injury uh, as body rejecting that ACL. Uh, sticking around with with the light guys, we got a flyweight fight at UFC one 156, one we actually talked about a couple weeks ago and thought, and we all I think anonymously agreed that it should be made for the next crack at the flyweight title. Uh, you have Ian McCall and Joseph Benavidez fighting at UFC 156. This is going to be a really great card. Uh, both of them are pretty good, good wrestlers. Um, and both of them actually are coming off against losses against Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson. 
Um, Ian McCall, yet yet to get a victory in his UFC career. Joseph Benavidez obviously has a lot of wins in his Zufa career. Who do you have in this one? I mean, God, you know, part of me wants to go with Ian McCall because he's been on our podcast and he's a great, great guest. But part of me wants to go with Benavidez because he's just such a powerful wrestler and, and he was a huge favorite against Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson. Um, I don't know if that that was a fluke fight. I don't know if Ian McCall's last fight against Johnson was a fluke fight. So far, I'm I'm gonna need need to hear more about how how both guys are training. If I had to make a pick, I'm taking Ian McCall literally only because he came on our show and Benavides hasn't. But uh, Dave, what do you think about this fight? Who you got? Oh, it's a tough fight to pick, in my opinion. Um, I look at it. And this way, you know, we see McCall go go um, with Johnson twice, and they both go to decisions. And we see, you know, Benavides fight Johnson. They both he went to a decision, but I think McCall likes to strike a little more than he likes to wrestle and stuff. And Benavides, you know, we know is no stranger to striking. I think it's where McCall can get in trouble with him because Benavides is a hell of a lot better of a striker than Muddy Mouse is. Muddy Mouse is just that quick guy; it's in and out, in and out, and likes to wrestle. Um, I think McCall could get in trouble if he starts going into strike in exchange with Benavidez. We know he has some power, like he fights a couple classes higher than he actually does. Um, you know, I do like McCall as, a, as an overall, you know, just a fighter. And um, he's seen him on a couple of the podcasts that you guys do. And he is, he's a good guy to root for and stuff. But it he's kind of funny, too. Um, it's a tough fight. I probably have to say it with uh, Benavidez at the current moment. The flyweights are really so hard to judge, too. It's it's one of those things. Anytime you watch a flyweight fight, their work rate is so insane. It, it really is. Even unlike the unlike the bantamweight class, you go ten pounds up, and it's still it's just it's not even the same. Um, these hundred and twenty fivers, they just they're like watching a, a caged hummingbird razor wire fight or something like that. It's just half the time I I feel like I don't even know who's winning. Um, and when you have two super high level flyweights like this, um, gosh, it just it really makes it tough to choose. And they're so similar in their skill sets too. Both have really good stand up. Um, both have really good wrestling. And gosh, it, it, it's so hard for me. I know Ian McCall. He's a huge flyweight. He really is. Um, I think he walks around something at like one fifty five after he weighs in. I, I could be mistaken with those numbers, but. He is a, a large flyweight, um, and I really like his boxing and wrestling. I, I could see him beating Benavidez for sure, but on the same token, I mean, Benavidez, he's he's world-class as well. Um, he, he's got a great arsenal. We saw him beat up a much bigger Eddie, Eddie Wineland. I mean, heck, we saw him beat up everybody at 135 that wasn't named Dominic Cruz. Um, so super tough call. I'd probably have to go with, uh, with McCall. This is a, obviously a great fight on paper. <clears throat> paper easily, you know, number two and number three guy in the weight class at the moment. So that just makes the fight even more relevant. It's for me, it's very very hard to pick up against Benavidez. Benavidez is just such a beast. He was a beast at one three five, and he's certainly a beast at one two five. And I know what Jake's saying. I think what Jake was saying earlier on was his heart is picking McCall. But his head is picking Benavidez, and yep. I always when I make when I when we do make our picks, uh, obviously we do it on on the MA playground. I always go with, with my heart, and there's been times where I want to go with my head, but I just try not to. So I'd have to go for Benavidez. I think it'd go to a decision, especially if it's a three round fight. But I would expect Benavidez to win. It's not who I'd be rooting for, but I'd expect him to win. Well, as I was thinking about how to break this fight down, two things came to mind. Uh, number one, the performances against Demetrius Johnson, like you guys have brought up earlier. Uh, McCall had a great first fight, and then in that second fight, uh, he said it was a weight cut that you know really got to him. And then you look at Benavidez. Benavidez did very well. I mean, yes, he lost, but his scrambling as a wrestler is one of his biggest attributes. He can scramble to an advantageous position, Whereas McCall is just more of a, uh, a a power wrestler, where he doesn't really use scrambles that much. He just uses top game. So I'd have to give Benavidez the edge in that department. And then let's look at Benavidez when he loses. He lost to Dominic Cruz, came back, knocked out Ronnie Yaya, choked out Miguel Torres, got his rematch, lost to Dominic Cruz in a split decision, came back after that and had a 
a three fight win streak in the UFC at 135 and then also had a successful 125 debut. So that's four, a four fight win streak that he had in, uh, his UFC career. So, uh, I'm going to say based off of Benavidez coming off of a loss and looking stronger and being better at scrambling, I definitely have Benavidez in this fight. <clears throat> yeah, sounds like kind of a mixed bag for that one as well, like uh, like we had with the topic before. Um, we'll uh, stick with one more topic, stick with the lighter guys before we get to our bonehead of the week. Uri Faber versus Ivan Minjavar. Luckily, they... They took Von Lee out of this fight. I don't think anyone thought Von Lee had much of a chance against Uriah Faber, especially after losing to TJ Dillashaw. Minjavar is going to be a much more game opponent. He had that slick submission last week or a couple weeks ago at UFC 154. This is uh, still... I mean, still, I I do think Uriah will win. It'll be a tougher opponent. It'll be luckily someone who probably won't be afraid to exchange with him. I don't think Minjavar has the tools to get this this one to to the ground. Um, and in a stand up war, I I have your eye favor winning this fight. Um, I think in either case, they they want to see Faber build himself build himself back up to to the title. He's kind of like the lighter version of Chael Sonnen, and they really want to give him as many title shots as possible. And uh, especially for that reason, I have Faber winning this. What about you guys? Yeah, um, I definitely like Faber here too. Medjavar is good, but I think Faber is just a little bit better. Uh, I don't know. It's, they know they, I know they fought before. I don't know who won. I'm assuming it was Faber. Um, I just like him here. He's always at the top. You know, he just falls a little short when it comes to title fights. I think he's, you know, the best number two guy, not named Chael Sutton, for fighters. Yeah, this is a this is another hard fight to call. Um, Menjavar is a beast. Faber is a beast. Um, I mean, they they've got they've got all the tools in the world. Um, Menjavar, he's just he's been looking real good since he's been in the UFC. Great stand and elbow knockout over, uh, I believe it was Demacio Page. Uh, lots of solid victories, victories over John Albert and um, his his victory uh, a few months ago or a few weeks ago at UFC 154. Um, Faber's been looking good too, in spite of his title losses to Burrell and Dominic Cruz. Both of those guys are are just tough nuts to crack, really, and. Faber, in spite of those losses, I feel he has been continuing to improve even since his WEC title days. Um, it looks like his boxing has come along a little bit more, and his wrestling is, is always top-notch, training with Team Alpha Male. Super tough fight to call. I, I'd probably have to go with Faber in this one just just by default, but um, you know, I, I could see Menjvar potentially getting the win. And uh, it, it certainly isn't going to be easy for Faber at all. I must admit, I'm not. Re- I'm not really excited by this fight. I like. I do like Uriah Faber, but I've just never been that bothered with with Mangevar. It just. I don't know what it is. It's just never really stood out. Stood out to me. So I'll be picking a Faber win. The only thing I'll be debating is is how I pick it. Is it going to be knockout? Is it going to be submission? Or is it going to be or decision? I don't know. But I'll definitely be picking Faber to win. I just don't know how yet. Well, this fight is actually easy for me to call. Patrick brought up the point that they're both beasts, and I do agree with that. Menjavar has a funky style where he uses a lot of spinning attacks, and he's very strong for the weight class. But two things that stand out to me is that Uriah Faber is very fast on the feet. He was able to knock down and rock Dominic Cruz, which is no easy feat. And Ivan Menjavar leaves himself open standing on the feet. His uh, striking defense is kind of porous. He got easily dropped by John Albert, who, you know, is obviously a great fighter, but nowhere near Faber's level. So I definitely have Faber in this fight. I don't think it'll be by submission. I'm going to go ahead and guess KO or TKO on this one. Wow, yeah. Um, I think uh, we all pretty much agree that there will be a uh, finish. Both both dudes fight a very exciting style. Looks like we have Ramsey's on the call, so all of you... Uh, Ramsey's fans out there. He is he is joining us now and just in time for Bonehead of the Week. You guys ready? 
Ready? Yeah. Ready. Yeah, son. Boom, 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 boom. Tell me what you gonna do, but it ain't no better problem. And I guess if I'm leading off Bonehead of the Week, um, I have to go with Frost as a hobby. You know, the... There are lots of times when when trainers will uh, you know lobby for for their uh, fighter, and obviously you know it's it's what you've you've got to do if you're looking out for your uh, your guy. But you know <clears throat> there are ways to to be genuine about it. There are ways, even if you aren't genuine about it, to sound genuine. Frost a hobby coming out saying that Nick Diaz is the top contender in the welterweight division. Come on, man. We all know you don't want to fight Johnny Hendricks, but just come out and say say that straight up. I mean, you know, in, in both senses, I think GSP wants to fight Diaz more because there's a lot of animosity there, and Diaz poses a lot less threats for him than Johnny Hendricks. So my bonehead of the week goes to Frost Zahabi for trying to be coy, trying to say, oh, yeah, I think Diaz deserves the title shot. No, he doesn't. Stop. Just Just stop. Yeah, that is a bonehead. Mine is Rory McDonald. I think he's a fantastic fighter and has a lot of potential. But whenever BJ Penn has abs, you're in for a world of hurt. And he said he's going to annihilate BJ Penn, and he'll probably die in the cage. And at the pre-fight press conference today, BJ called him out on that. He's like, "Yeah, he's been saying a lot of saying a lot of shit. You better back it up come fight night." And that's absolutely true. I'm not the world's biggest BJ Penn fan, but I'm rooting for him after Rory said that stupid shit and dresses like a complete fucking idiot. Hey yo. <laughs> nice. All right, guys. Uh, Rams is here. Sorry I'm late, guys. Thank, uh, you know, thanks for taking me again on the round table here. Good to be part of it. Sorry I'm late. I, that's unprofessional. My bonehead of the week. Um, it has to be Steven Seagal for coming out and challenging uh, Randy Couture to a fucking no-holds-barred street fight that apparently cannot be witnessed by anyone else on the planet. Um, uh, it was on the Ariel Hawani show earlier this week. Steven Seagal, he, he just out of nowhere just calls him out for a, for, for a fight. He seemed, like with Steven Seagal, it's like you're never sure if he's serious or not, um, but, but he probably thinks he is. What, what I think... Like I was saying, uh, I, I touched on it a little bit yesterday, but I'm, I'm, I, what, I, what I think the case is, is that Steven Seagal has never used the internet in his entire life. He has no idea what it is. Um, I have no idea who his PR people are, or if he even has any, who the people are around him. I don't know why they keep putting him on the phone with Ariel Hawani and letting him make that call. Uh, he, he makes a fool out of himself every single fucking time. And he still hasn't caught on that the whole thing is a troll. That's why Steven Seagal is the bonehead of the week. Um, he doesn't know that he's the joke of the MMA world as far as the internet and 80s action film stars goes. Uh, he hasn't figured it out yet. He's serious about fighting Randy Couture behind the goddamn uh, KFC, Burger King, back alley, wherever. I- I'd pay money to see it, but of course, uh, tickets aren't on sale. Steven Seagal, you suck. <laughs> My bonehead is none other than the UFC again. Seems like I like to pick on them quite often. Um, I don't know exactly who this falls on, whether it's Dana, Joe Silva, whoever makes the calls, but uh, my uh, bonehead is going to be the UFC for putting um, Renan Barrow versus Michael McDonald on Fuel TV. I think it's a wasted opportunity to really showcase those two young fighters. Um, I thought that would look great on like a UFC Fox 7 or even as a main event, co-main event or something on a pay-per-view. No disrespect to any of the people in the UK. I mean, they're still getting to see a great fight. I just don't like it being on Fuel TV. No disrespect taken there, but I'm glad it's on Fuel TV. But uh, well, I'm glad it's on in the UK anyway. My bonehead of the week is, again, uh, Dana White. Uh, again, I don't know if it's Dana White or UFC, but we thought that Dana White is UFC, basically. So we, we, we'll put it with Dana White. Uh, and mine is for is the treatment uh, of the guys on the smashes. Um, I'm going to read this out. So he didn't. He hasn't treated the guys the same way as he, as he has done on previous seasons. On the Tough Coaches Challenge, it's always been, and I've never known it to be any different, Whichever tough coach wins, he gets 10 grand or whatever it is. And then each of his fighters gets about £1,500 or $1,500. Uh, there was no money for the UK guys this time when Ross Pearson won the coaches challenge. 
And then for the last few seasons, including Ultimate Brazil, which I watched, at the end of the season, there's been a KO of the season, a sub of the season, and a fight of the season. Uh, and they've, uh, I think they've beat the fighters have got something like a $25,000 bonus. And again, at the end of the season, this season, there was nothing announced. So, I mean, you know, for the KO of the season, Robert Whittaker, uh, his KO over Luke, Luke Newman, he deserved the money. And for the sub of the season, uh, Colin Fletcher for his uh, Kimura uh, uh, in the semi-final. I, I hadn't picked the fight this season, but I think if they're doing it for other seasons, they should have done it for this season as well. Definitely. Yeah, great selection oh, this sorry. week. No, quite right. Um, what yeah, the hell, me? interrupting and shit? <laughs> come on, come on, let's maintain order here. For me, my bonehead of the week is Dana White, but for uh, different reasons than Ray, although Ray really does have uh, some good reasons there. Um, I'm picking Dana White's bonehead of the week because he stated at the UFC on Fox 5 press conference today that Nick Diaz is probably going to get the next title shot at GSP. Now, I'm probably the biggest Nick Diaz fan in the world. I, I root the Diaz brothers very, uh, very enthusiastically. And... I, I, I'm one of those deluded fools who thinks that Diaz will beat GSP in the Octagon. I, I will go on record and say that. Um, but at the same time, I really don't think he has a, a shot or he, he doesn't have a place here. Like, he's, he's really not deserving. I mean, he just lost to Carlos Condit, although in my mind, I don't think he lost. I'm screaming one, two, and five. And I mean, I could go on forever about that fight. But according to the judges, he lost. Be that as it may, you have to take at least one more fight. I mean, I don't want to see anybody fighting for a title coming off a loss, um, even if it is my favorite fighter. So I got to pick Dana White as my bonehead of the week for picking Nick Diaz as number one contender at welterweight. And my my bonehead, I'm completely with with you, Patrick. I. I was sure that George St. Pierre was either going to be taking on Anderson Silva or Johnny Hendricks, because those were really the only two fights that made sense. If GSP were to stay at welterweight, you got to give Johnny Hendricks this, this chance. He's won five in a row against five top guys. You know, the last three wins he has are convincing wins against Koscheck, Fitch, and Kamen. Um, just really, really bugs me that, that this is going on and they're, they're giving... Uh, Nick Diaz, this this title shot, it's it's almost as bad as Jones Son, and, and like Michael Chiavello said on our podcast about a month ago, it's not for rankings, it's for ratings, and yeah, this is totally a ratings move, and is unexcusable, my bonehead is Dana White for making this Diaz GSP joke of a title fight. Same. <laughs> Ramses? Ramses uh, is up. up. Wait a minute. I thought we were still on Bonehead of the Week. We, we are, are still you. on Bonehead of the Week. I, already, I did Steven Seagal. And then we go around and vote for who we think is the supreme Bonehead. Man, you must have oh, gotten sorry. high as can't hell. Your own. You can't I'm choose sorry. your own. Ramses. I, I got here as soon as I could, guys. God right. damn it, Roman. <laughs> soggy fucking noodle, you. Yeah, uh, uh, I don't even know what you guys are talking about, Dana White. He's just doing what he's supposed to do. He's putting on the fights that the fans want to see or that's going to make the most money for his organization. Um, so I can't I can't fault him for that. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll stick with my guy, my pick. Steve Trigal. You can't. Oh, God oh, damn it, God. you can't. <laughs> the one thing that Chris said, you can't pick your own guy. Come on, son. Oh, Jesus Christ. And right tight to the chat. <sighs> <laughs> You're about as reliable well, then, as a bag of cats. Sorry about that, guys. It's been a rough day, but um, yeah. Then Rory McDonald, it would have to be because the kid. There's no. He doesn't even care if he wins or loses. You can see that on his face every time he talks. He's he's got dead eyes, man. There's no there's no soul in his in his eyes, uh, and so he just acts a fool. Uh, did, like he he responds like he's half in a coma. Um, so yeah, I'll go with him because he's probably the least intelligent person on the list. I think I'm going to go with Rory myself. Um, uh, yeah, fuck it. Rory McDonald. I'm voting for Patrick's one, for Dana White. 
for making the Diaz GSP. I so wanted to see GSP versus Hendrick, so I'm making that my bonehead of the week. And for me, I'll have to decide with Rory McDonald being the bonehead of the week. Uh, Ray brought up uh, some uh, really good points regarding the uh, tough bonuses. Um, it definitely should be a, a uniform system as far as that's concerned. But for Rory McDonald to just go about and, and spew off of the mouth with what he was talking today, that's that's some garbage talk. He needs to knock that shit off. And, uh, yeah, he's the bonehead of the week. Looks like we got another draw. We have a tie between Dana White and Rory McDonald as the supreme bonehead. Uh, maybe, maybe on our next show we'll make up our minds. But, uh, yeah. Good, good bonehead. We have some MMA boneheads again instead of last time when we came at you with just a bunch of personal boneheads. But um, yeah, personal bonehead sounds sounds like a dirty term. Anyway, um, let's That's let's talk. That's a whole ta- other segment. That is a whole other podcast. Um, <laughs> one one topic I, I I wanted to get on last week is Nick. Denis retiring. Uh, really, you know, usually when when guys retire, it's either it's either for a, a few reasons they just aren't good enough and can't compete on the big show, and they they retire. They retire because of an injury, kind of like you saw with Nate Nate Quarry after he fought Jorge Rivera. Um, obviously had back troubles as well. Definitely check out that interview we had yesterday too. That was really amazing. Um, or just because of more more usual than not, just because of old age. Nick Denis retires, doesn't fit any of those cri- uh, criteria, obviously good enough to be in the UFC, isn't injured, isn't old, but he cites potential brain injuries down the road and doesn't want to be one of these guys like Muhammad Ali who's struggling to just live his life, period, because he's gotten rattled around so, so bad. You know, I've I have heard a, a, a lot of... Um, a lot of ideas brought up on to how we we can prevent these injuries specific, specifically brain injuries um, none of which I like I don't think putting more padding in the gloves will help you see boxers get more brain injuries than MMA fighters because even though you would think the padding softens the blow it isn't necessarily about the impact it's about the the mass being put to to your head and a in a 16 ounce glove long term will do more damage than a four ounce glove um you know i've heard people say that you should be able to wear headgear and that's just ridiculous um you know there's this is such a violent sport there are other sports like hockey football where it's easier to go in and you know put in regulations and rules whether it's about the way you tackle the way you hit what you wear to help brain injuries but in such a you know cut and dry sport like MMA where you know you're you're not going to be wearing any head headgear and the goal is to give the other guy concussive damage there's there's nothing I can really think of to prevent these injuries in mixed martial arts but uh, what do you guys think? Do uh, you all think there's there's anything we can do to prevent these injuries? I certainly don't. I mean, I've never competed in mixed martial arts in my life, but I played just about every kind of sport you could think of. Did football? Um, I mean, and I've dealt with so many concussive forces in my life. That's just something that's going to happen time to time. I mean, I've been in four car accidents. I got hit in the head with a golf club. Things happen, you know. And, uh, sometimes you get blasted and you get a little rocked and, um, that's, that's just day to day life. Um, so if, if brain damage is something you're worried about, mixed martial arts is not the sport for you to be in. Um, I would like to say though, that I, I don't think that, you know, Muhammad Ali gets brought up and yeah, he's in a bad way, but people keep saying, Oh, he got Parkinson's disease from boxing. You don't get a disease from being punched in the face. And if that's the case, then we need to relabel it as like a condition, Parkinson's condition. But again, that's a whole nother subject. Um, yeah, you see people who can get real punch drunk. You get knocked out a couple of times and um, you you don't start or you start uh, talking a little slower. You can't form a sentence. These guys can't even keep a, a single train of thought going. So for Nick Denis, I respect him to get out of the sport because it's like, hey, he got knocked out a couple times. This is a guy, he's going for his doctorate. He's a smart dude. And he's like, hey, I want to be able to remember some of the stuff I learned and, you know, go be a doctor. And uh, it was great watching him. If you want to avoid brain damage, don't get in the octagon. It's simple as that. 
I don't. I mean, it's it's stra- it's, a, it's a very strange call from Nick Denny because surely, when he got into the sport, he knew that he was going to get punched in the head. I, I don't. I just don't understand why all of a sudden he's got this concern about uh, potential brain damage. I mean, it's very very strange. I mean. There's, there's a risk. You can say this about pretty much anything that you do. There's a risk to, and even when you're sitting in an office typing on a keyboard, you can get blooming repetitive wrist injury and all of that. So, I don't really think you can live your life like that. You've just got to go out and do the best you can with what you've got. But if you don't want brain injury, don't fight. Great points. And there's one thing that I want to bring up that you guys haven't broached yet. As far as track records go for mixed martial arts sanctioned events, it's pretty goddamn good. There's been a handful of deaths. Uh, very few injuries, uh, as, as far as the big shows go, anyways. So I, I think, you know, with highly trained individuals, it's going to be a very low percentage. And, and I think this is the only time I'll be able to say it, so I'll say it now. I think Nick is hurt, and I think Nick is scared. Hurt, scared. <laughs> well, um, yeah, he he probably did get hurt, and he, and he it probably did scare the shit out of him. I think there's a part of the story that he that we're not even hearing. Um, because whatever happened to him, uh, it must have been like one of those holy fuck, like my brain is not working right now moments for him where he wasn't, he must have had some sort of damage to where like maybe you, the brain is so fucking complex. Um, you can get it rocked in several ways and not even know about it for, for weeks, years, months. But, but apparently whatever happened to the, whatever happened to this guy, whatever happened to Nick, uh, it it was probably it was so traumatizing and so like such a such an eye opener um, that he, he instant that he decided to retire. I mean, uh, like I got to steal a quote from from my man Chael Son. This is the sport of fighting, right? Um, there's nothing you can do to prevent it because you can't prevent someone getting hurt during a fight. Just that just that idea alone. That sorry, you're, you're gonna have a fight. And you can't keep people from being hurt during a fight. That's the whole purpose of a fight, to hurt each other. Um, you know, you can say it's a sport and competition and all you want, but no, they're, they're in a cage. They're locked in a cage hurting each other. Uh, so whatever happened to Nick, that's, that's, it was probably really scary. I don't even want to know what I understand when you walk away. And that's why I feel bad. Like anytime, anytime you guys hear me call any fighter like a bum or say he looked like 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 you know like Kimbo Slice or something like that or, or James Tony, like uh, take it with a grain of salt because I'm just saying he he looked like a bum compared to whoever he was probably fighting compared to any normal humans like us walking around who don't fight for a living. Um, they always deserve respect. The fighters always deserve respect for getting in there at all. Um, so, but so anytime they want to walk away from that, I, I completely understand. I understand mayhem walking away with his blown out knee. I understand BJ Penn retiring because he didn't want to go home looking like that after after he got the fuck beaten out of his face. And I understand uh, like Nate Quarry, your guest last night, um, he he retired because he came home after after getting his face you know actually b- butchered. And he said his little girl was so traumatized by seeing him that way that he just he just could not ever fight again. Um, so I understand it is scary, but that's what they signed up for. I mean, don't don't ever feel bad for the fighters if if they're trying to say I didn't know I was going to get hurt. Because if you ever hear a fighter say that, uh, he doesn't belong in the fucking ring. A uh, red flag warning, get warning, warning. But these other guys, they all deserve the respect. Uh, uh, and. And yeah, there's nothing you can do about it. No headgear, no armor. This isn't the NFL. No armor. It's a fight. It's a cage. That's all it's going to come down to every time. Somebody's going to get hurt. Yeah, I mean, I really don't have nothing different else to add except no. Uh, I definitely don't think there's any way you can prevent anything. Um, unless you make it, want to look, make it look amateurish with the headgear and stuff like that. But these are professionals. They went through all that they know what they're signed up for the only thing i would suggest is that if you're thinking about becoming a fighter that's what you want to do for your career always have the backup plan going because if you don't cut it or you know you get injured and you can't continue you always got to fall back on something so maybe you should they should concentrate on all the backup plan a little bit more because either you could have a long career or short career in this fight game um but yeah there's definitely no way you can prevent head injuries unless you want to start wearing head gear and whatnot and that's definitely not happening so no you can't prevent head injuries for sure, for sure. I think all of us agree, you know, it's it's a fight game and unless you're 
ready to you know face the the consequences. I uh, gotta be gotta be ready for it. Um, one one more topic before we go on to guess that tweet. And what a what a segment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, beating you all senselessly in that, but you know this is probably the uh, biggest news of the week. Actually, came out a few hours ago. Dana says Diaz is next for GSP. I I really have no idea. We we talked about it during the Bonehead. Half of us picked Dana White as our Bonehead. Uh man, how how wild. Like I mentioned. Um, when I picked Dana White as my bonehead, everyone thought it was going to be Hendricks or Silva, and Hendricks on this amazing run, Nick Diaz coming off of a loss, and literally just for ratings, just because, I don't know if probably more fans want Hendricks than Diaz, you know, obviously the build-up to the fight's going to be better with Diaz, because Diaz talks a lot of shit, and Hendricks doesn't, you know, this is almost like like when Dan Henderson, when Sauna was put in against Jones, said, "Oh, I guess I need to start going to shit talking school." Maybe Hendricks should should have you know been been a little more caustic in the way he was talking about GSP. Maybe if Hendricks was talking crap about GSP, he would have gotten the fight. Um, I've I've seen a mixed bag on Twitter. Most people think Hendricks was robbed. A few people want to see the the Diaz fight. Um, but what do you guys think? Is 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 this an absolute robbery for Johnny Hendricks? I think it's an absolute robbery for Johnny Hendricks. I mean, uh, I think Patrick summed up well earlier on. No one should get a title shot coming off a loss, regardless of whether you agree with that loss or not. You know, Nick Diaz didn't get that decision against Carlos Condit. So how do you lose a fight and then go on to be the number one contender? And then you've got Johnny Hendricks who just is knocking people out for fun. And when he knocks people out, he doesn't just knock out your average welterweight. He knocks out the blooming best welterweights in the world that aren't GSP. You know, John Fitch was, was ranked number two at the time he knocked him out. Mine Campman, for a long time on uh, Fight Matrix, was ranked number one because GSP was inactive, and he knocks him out. And it doesn't take him ages to do it. He does it within blooming 20 seconds. I mean, there's no... You, you, there's no other theory, there's no other way of looking at it. There's only one man at the minute who deserves a total shot against GSP. And I think we all we all agree it's, it's Johnny Hendricks. It's just absolutely mental. MMA, MMA mental. mental. Oh. Okay. Yeah. That, was, that was pathetic. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> pathetic. Aww. Well, give us another chance and we'll uh, try and do, do you good. So, yes, is this a robbery? Obviously it is. It's a robbery for the sport. Uh, what it is not a robbery for is ratings and a solid pay-per-view for the UFC. You can't blame the promotion for putting on a fight that would sell a lot of you know a lot of pay-per-views. I mean, as much as we think it's stupid, guess what? At the end of the day, it is a business, and telling from recent matchmaking history, they are kind of going the route of making big money fights for champions. So. I mean, I, I, I can't be too pissed about it. And what's next for Hendricks? I mean, what guy at welterweight is right up there with him right now? There's really no one. Diaz is fighting GSP, who's obviously a high-level guy. Screw it, man. Put him up against Condit. Hendricks versus Condit sounds like an excellent fight, and I'm pretty sure that we brought it up on last week's podcast. Okay, right here is where you would uh, start to play the theme song to Unsolved Mysteries because I'm about to get a little conspiratorial on you guys once again. Um, so this came out today, right? Dana White just offhandedly says uh, Diaz is next for GSP. Is that is that how you're telling me it went down? Because like I said, I've been out of it all day. He, he just, uh, just during the press call or for, for this weekend or something, he just put it out there. Did, did, he, did he say when and where? Uh, I haven't even caught up on the details myself, and I consider myself an insider. There are no uh, sp- there are no uh, specifics out yet, but but Dana said that uh, because George Saint Saint Pierre doesn't ask for much, he's really begging for this Diaz fight, and didn't say certainly, but but said that the next fight for George Saint Pierre is probably going to be Nick Diaz. Yeah, uh, that's where I got to call bullshit. Um, he, he said he. George St. Pierre doesn't ask for much. What are you talking about? My whole conspiracy is that um, since GSP asked for $50 million for the Anderson Silva fight, this is Dana White's answer to him, saying, um, oh, oh yeah, uh, how about 
no, you're gonna fight Anderson Silva for whatever we, we give you that's reasonable, or else I'm gonna throw your ass to the wolves. I'm gonna throw your ass to Diaz. So that's what he's saying right now with this coming out here. I don't think they're, they're gonna announce a, th- a when and where. Um, I still think the Anderson Silva versus GSP fight is next. I'm still sticking to it, even though Dan White said otherwise. I think this is all just more negotiation and proceedings. That's all. Um, I think it's definitely a rivalry. Um, you know, it, it doesn't need to be said again what Henderson is going to deserve the title shot. But I could also see why the UFC is going in this route. But he has the title shot at the same time. Um, this is just one of those better for business type deals. It sucks that Hendricks is getting screwed over in it. But uh, just a little while ago, Dana White did tweet him saying, "Yes, you will get a title shot." Didn't say when. Um, he, you know, he does definitely notice this Hendricks, so he knows he's there. But at the same time, you know, they're just riding the hot ticket right now, which is Diaz versus GSP. Don't forget that fight was scheduled before even the Diaz um, kind of fight that we had, but Diaz himself personally screwed himself over. I ain't getting it. You know, it, he did have the title shot then and there. You know, he for some reason, somewhere in his head, he skipped out on those, um, what is it, promotion, promoting the fight with GSP at the, a couple of events, so he got bumped off it. Um, you know, it's... I personally would like to see Hendricks get that title shot. Um, you know, he still standing by that he's going to just sit and wait out for his shot, which I think, you know, might hurt him, might not. Uh, he hasn't really had much action because he finishes his fight so quick, so I really don't think it's going to be that much a problem for him if he sits and waits out. As long as this fight, supposed fight, isn't going to happen, you know, towards the end of the year, happen sometime early summer. Um, you know, him sitting out won't be such a bad thing waiting to get the winner of Diaz versus GSP. Definitely a robbery for um, I, I picked this as my bonehead of the week on Dana White's part for making this fight. And again, I'm a huge Diaz fan. I really do think that Diaz would be able to beat GSP standing. I don't think GSP would be able to lay and pray him. Uh, if you look at GSP versus Carlos Condit, just what was going on in that fight, Carlos Condit didn't even throw up a rubber guard until like the fifth round. Nick Diaz is so active off the back. It, it's insane. Um, I think he can very likely break GSP's arm. I think he can submit GSP. I think he can knock him out. And I, I can't wait for that fight. But the thing is, and again, as huge a Diaz fan as I am, I, I, I try and look at this subjectively. And Johnny Hendricks... <laughs> Like I, I don't know. I think he he can knock anybody out. I believe he could knock Diaz out. I believe he could knock GSP out. That dude is a beast. He had the one loss to Rick Story, and he's come back just uh, a man on fire since then. He really looks improved. Um, Story's a beast himself. He he and uh, Johnny Hendricks they're really cut from the same cloth. Dynamite, and, and they've just got these lead jaws. Um, it's it's just. A really, it's insane how good Johnny Hendricks is. Um, I, I don't know if if this fight were to go down, if Diaz versus GSP were to go down, say around February or March, after Diaz's suspension is lifted, then I would like to see Johnny Hendricks fight perhaps uh, Rory McDonald around the same time. If he were to beat BJ Penn or BJ Penn, if he were to beat Rory McDonald. For sure, yeah. And uh, before we go on to guess that tweet, what's next for Johnny Hendricks? Do you have him sit on the shelf and wait for the title shot? I've actually heard um, Dana White say that they would put Hendricks in another match, but Hendricks himself is saying, no, I, I, I want to wait for my, my deserved title shot. Don't really know what's going to happen there. Um, if Hendricks does fight again, I see him fighting the winner of this weekend's Rory McDonald BJ Penn fight. What do you guys think's next for Big Rig? I think that he should sit out and wait. He's he's, he's more than earned the right for his for his title shot, and I think it'd be very risky to put it on the line against uh, the winner of Penn McDonald. I'm thinking McDonald's going to win. I'd, I'd, if I was him, I'd sit out and wait. The, with what he's done so far, uh, he deserves it. He deserves that title shot. Yeah, man. Um, 
I, I would have to tend to just agree with Ray. There's not much I can really add to it, so I'm going to go ahead and you know wholeheartedly agree with Ray. Yeah, for Johnny Hendricks, what's next for him? Uh, it's it's nothing, unfortunately, and it's really sad that they're doing this to this guy. It, it's it's sad that that has to happen to Johnny Hendricks. But, uh, you know, it is a business at the end of the day. The UFC is a business, and he's and he's not on, on the uh, money-making end of it right now. Um, what, what he's going to have to do, honestly, realistically, he's just going to have to wait for his next fight and knock that fucker out amazingly, too. And then he's going to have to demand another shot. I mean, because, let's face it, um, he didn't get one. He, he hasn't gotten one unless somebody... Uh, at least one or two people get hurt, which which is possible. Then maybe he'll get a shot. Other than that, he's got to wait and just uh, prove himself once again, even though he already has several times over. Sorry, Johnny. Yeah, I uh, seem to have pulled the reins and went a little ahead of myself in order to answer the question and the original one. But, yeah, I, I definitely think he should just sit and wait it out. Um, it's not going to hurt him at all. He's proved himself. Um, he doesn't have to prove himself anymore. Why risk, you know, boot, you know, getting or excuse me? Why lose risking a uh, loss in a fight when you definitely deserve to be, you know, fighting for a belt next? So unless if Diaz gets injured, you might as well just sit and wait out until that fight happens and they get a winner, and then they can make the fight from there and give him his title shot. Yeah, and I know I, I kind of went over this myself in, in the last bit of questioning. But I definitely think Johnny Hendricks should take another fight. And that's just, that's always going to be my stance for anybody. If you're the number one contender and there's some sort of situation, don't sit out for six months. Don't sit out for nine months or a year and just say, oh, I made it this far. I want to get my title shot. If you're going to be the champion at some point, you're going to have to fight all these different contenders. You know, who want the, the same reason I don't want Diaz to get this title shot against GSP because I think even if he could beat GSP, he'd probably get knocked out against Johnny Hendricks. And you don't want that to be the situation. At least personally, I know I wouldn't. I'd rather fight as many guys as I could on the way up, beating everybody, cleaning out the division, and then taking out the champion. I mean, otherwise, you're just going to get in there. Maybe you can get your hands on a belt, but are you going to be able to keep it? You know, I don't know with a, a work ethic like that. I think you got to take on all comers. I'd like to see Johnny Hendricks fight Josh Koscheck again, actually, because I don't think he beat him in their fight. For sure. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's a, a really kind of an un, unfortunate thing, but, you know, we'll we'll see what, what happens. For Big Rig Hendricks, um, I think we all think he, he deserves that, um, that, that title shot. And, yeah, without any further ado... Let us get to guess that tweet. The current standings, Team MMA Podcast, out in front of Team MMA Mental, 5-3. to three. Um, I'm, I I hate to toot my own horn. No, actually, I, I love tooting my own horn. Uh, I have four here victories. He here here, really here I go, tooting, tooting it. I have four oh, wins. Boy. Chris has one, Patrick has one, Dave has one, Ray has one, and Ramsey's uh, new new to the show, so he doesn't have any Ramen victories has yet. None. Ramen has none. So you know what? I'll I'll host it this week just to give you poor excuses for guess that tweet players a chance to win. Uh, let's do it. Guess that tweet. All right. Um, I have a special theme with this week's version of guess that tweet. And that theme is uh, that that theme is Instagram. All of these are captions to an Instagram tweet. And I'll uh, start it off with this one. It was it was a tweet uh, the day after Thanksgiving, and the tweet is: "Man's giving is today. Today will be rougher than yesterday. 170. Here I come." And the picture is of ja- a big bottle of Jack Daniels and a bunch of fried chicken. Um, and that is man's giving us today. Today will be rougher than yesterday. 170, here I come. So it's from a lightweight. And your five choices are Gilbert Melendez, Anthony Pettis, Joe Lauzon, Eddie Alvarez, and Gray Maynard. Definitely Gilbert Melendez. Oh, this is very interesting. Very interesting. I'll have to go with Joe Lozon. 
Uh, I'm at the goal. I'm one as myself. <laughs> Is it my turn? I'm sorry. No. Uh, Oops. Okay. Yes, it's your turn. Holy shit. Well, I thought somebody just went out of water. I, I wasn't sure what's going on. What the hell my, is going on, guys? My bad. I pulled a Chris. Okay, okay. All right. So I wasn't just too high. Um, yeah, uh, that tweet probably, uh, since Gray Manor, uh, even though he's injured, he has all the reasons to start partying. Uh, he's into, like, cocaine and hookers, right? That's his thing. So, no, I'll say Gil- Gilbert Melendez, the guy who's currently, what, probably unemployed right now at this point. You'd be drinking and eating fried fruits. I'm going to go for uh, uh, Gray Maynard. All right, so <clears throat> the answer is <laughs> Joe Lozon. I think Patrick was the only one who guessed that. That's so, right, uh, son. That's right, son. I can, tell, I can tell by your voice that you had already read that tweet, you son of a bitch. <laughs> oh, I had not. I had not read that tweet. Oh, sweet Jesus. Uh-huh, sure. You are so even, confident. Come on. I don't even follow Joe Lozon. I don't even mm-hmm. follow him. Mm-hmm. Wait a second. I might follow Joe Lozon. I'm not sure, but that's okay. Conspiracy theory. All right. We'll uh, do a snake draft, so we'll have everyone answer in the reverse order as we just did. And the next, guess that tweet. Dudes, help. This bathroom only had one sink, one urinal, and one handicap stall. I really had to go number two. What was I supposed to do? And the picture is of an old guy next to a walker, and he's kind of awkwardly leaning against the wall trying to pee. Obviously a handicapped person who was forced to use the urinal because uh, our our UFC uh, personality was was using the bathroom and... And you know this is this is always my uh, fear when I use a handicap stall that I'll end up jipping. You know so much about this bathroom because there's a picture of it. He took a picture of this this old guy taking a How piss. How long did you stare at this picture, Roman? Right, you give continue. us other stoners a bad name, dude. That's, That's very right. true. You're cooked. Your goose is cooked. <laughs> your your goose is cooked, cooked look son. At pictures of guys in the bathroom or whatever the hell's going on. <laughs> All right, right. Continue. Sorry. All right. It 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 was not a full frontal of the guy's penis. You dirty motherfucker. It was a picture of the the guy's back, and he was like kind of awkwardly slumped over trying to take a piss. I and 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 you know what? I would never take a picture of a guy taking a piss in the bathroom, but one of the following five people did, and your options are Pat Berry, Joseph Benavidez, Donald Cerrone, Mike Goldberg, and Matt Mitrione. Pop out, Um, you know, I talked in the chat, it sounded like Pat Berry, but I'm going to change it to Matt Mitrione. Yeah, I've also got to go with Matt Mitrione. That's one dirty ass motherfucker, and that seems like something that's right up his alley. Matt Mitrione. <laughs> this is such an inappropriate topic. I, I'm thinking this this has to be Pat Barry. I really don't see how it could be anybody else. Pat Barry. You're a fucking dumb, annoying stoner if you didn't go for Pat Barry. So I got Pat Barry. So. <laughs> Harsh words from Chris Lowe, and all of you Ow. picked either. I know, right? And uh, everyone picked Barry or Mitrione. Um, it was not Benavidez, wasn't Cerrone, wasn't Goldberg, and wasn't Mitrione. It was Pat Barry. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The I truth hurts. The truth hurts. I guess so. Hurts. Oh, so am I out to a two and zero start? P money out to a two and zero start. P money with two have. points. Chris and Ray with one. Dave and Ramsey's still at zero. I burped I when I said that. That was cool. Jake, um, where are you at? How many points? Do I, you have, Jake? I oh, no, actually, I have twenty points, <laughs> and I have already won this edition of Guess That Tweet for my fifth victory. No, um, <clears throat> all right. This this Instagram picture, it says, "This is what I was swatting flies with," and it's a picture of an M16. Um, looks like at a gun range. And uh, you know what? I'm going to put the same five names out there. Pat Berry, Joseph Benavidez, Donald Cerrone, Mike Goldberg, and Matt Mitrione. Chris? Oh, so we're not doing snake. We're, we're rotating. It goes back and forth like a snake. 
Okay, I got it. Back and forth. Got it. Um, you're a complete fucking idiot, dumb, stupid but if you don't go for <laughs> Cerami. <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah, I, I, I'll go with Cerami. I don't want to be a dumb, idiot, stupid butt. You have no... <sighs> Let's see. I'll, I'll just go against you. Um, <laughs> who, 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 was the, who was after Cerami? Was it Mike Goldberg? I'll go with yep. the motherfucking Mike Goldberg. Uh, it sounds like he's probably losing his mind these days. I know he's a... Well, okay. All right. I won't, I won't insult the man. I'll just guess that he tweeted that. Um... I'm getting bullied into picking Cerrone, so Cerrone. I'm thinking that the gun is probably bigger than Joseph Benavides, so it can't be Benavides. Oh and my I god. I, I don't want to follow everyone else, so I'm going to go for, uh, I'll go for Matt Mitrione. Going with Matt Mitrione again. Um, and you know what, guys? I'm sorry, but I tricked you. This also was from Pat Barry. Two in a row from Pat oh. HD Barry. The uh, ultimate curveball. The ultimate curveball. And uh, just just a reminder for everyone listening, we have five regular tweets, and then if anyone's tied after the five, we go to a sudden death tweet. No one can pick the same option, and uh, we we find ourselves a winner. Um, <clears throat> all right, this this one's kind of old. It came from Movember, and the uh, tweet is of, of him with a mustache. And the tweet is, Mustache Update. It's coming in better than I thought. I'm going to let it get super thick. My goal is to let it. And your options are, Tom Lawler, Rashad Evans, John Jones, John Dodson, or Bart Palaszewski. Ray? Ray? I'm thinking uh, Tom Law. I'm going Rashad Evans. He's been tweeting a lot of pictures about his mustache. I'm going him. I have to agree with Dave here. It's Rashad Evans. He went full Apollo Creed with that damn mustache and that haircut. Um, and I know it looked damn good on him. He got a positive response from the fans. Uh, so, uh, yes, Rashad Evans. You like dudes? Excuse me, sir. <laughs> Well, wait, ahead, a second. wait a second, guys. Off topic, off topic. Uh, yeah, I'll go with Rashad. All right, I'm going to beat the red herring. Palaszewski. Palaszewski. Unfortunately, it wasn't Palaszewski. Three of you got it right. It was Hushad Evans. Um, putting, putting Dave and Ramses on the board at one. Putting Patrick way out there with three. Uh, we might not need this overtime tweet after all. Actually, yeah, we definitely won't because uh, Patrick has already locked it up. We only have one more regulation tweet to go. And uh, just just for shits and giggles, let's let's cover the last two. And the uh, no. picture, <laughs> the uh, picture is is of a school zone sign. You know, one of those flashing signs out outside of a school where you only can drive like one mile an hour. And the tweet is, I'm sorry, America. 15 miles, ar- 15 miles per hour around high schools is ridiculous. Kids need to figure out how to cross a road safely without being babied. Which is a very valid point. Um, obviously, he starts it off, obviously, he starts it off with, I'm sorry, America. So it's a fighter from outside of America. And your, four, or your five choices are Stefan Struve. Stipe Miocic, Michael Bisbing, George Sotoropoulos, or Dan Hardy? Uh, Miocic is an American. Well, fuck me then. It's true, it's true. That fool from Ohio. Although he is of Croatian descent. Chris well, I died. meant Miocic's uh, mom then, Chris. Yeah, 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 yeah okay. You know what? <laughs> I know, I know it's a dumb fucking choice. Dumb, stupid, idiot choice. But I'm going sauce for some reason. There's something about George Sotteropoulos that's just kind of screaming at me. So I'm going sauce. I'm going to eat your little butt. You know what? And uh, for myself, your boy P-Money, I'm going with Dan Hardy. Because I tell you what, no offense, Ray, but Dan Hardy, he's getting more preachy than Bono. I tell you, I, I don't go over to England and say, hey, you guys need to change all your fucking shit. I don't want to hear it. Fucking don't tell me what I need to change in my country. It was Dan Hardy. 
I'm gonna have to go with Patrick and uh, just agree that I'm uh, out of hope that it was Dan Hardy because uh, he should start every tweet with "I'm sorry, America." <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm also thinking it's Dan Hardy. He's been spent a lot of time over here, so yeah, Dan Hardy. I'm gonna go for Stephen Street. Wow, kind of just just like the tweet before, uh, Patrick Ramsey's and Dave are right on this one. It is Dan Hardy. P-Money stringing together four oh, of five. Oh. Killing it, son. Um, Domination. Uh, and, I'll, oh. and, and I'll do to the last one just for shits and giggles. Uh, the, the picture, it's a very douchey picture of this fighter standing in front of a Christmas tree wearing a plaid shirt. And just like standing there smiling. And the tweet is simply, Hi! Hey, let's go. It's, it's just him in a plaid shirt saying, Hi! Standing in front of a Christmas tree. Your five options are Rory McDonald, John Jones, Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson, Luke Rockhold, and Josh Koscheck. I'll go for Demetrius Johnson. Mm, I'm going to go with Koscheck. You said he was wearing a plaid shirt, and uh, yes. but you. So my, I would have guessed Ariel Hawani, but you also said fighter. So the only <laughs> other fighter that I can think of who would wear a plaid shirt would be John Jones, and he would be lame like that, just putting out some Christmas crap. John Jones. You know what though, Ramsey's Rory McDonald. He's got just enough of that hipster douchebag blood in him to pull off the the plaid. I could see him rocking that. Um, I'm going to have to go with Rory. Rory is a safe bet. And you know what? I've been wrong this entire show, basically. So I'm going with <laughs> P-Money. I'm going with fucking Rory doesn't have a soul. Blank eyes. Great white shark. Hashtag idiot. <laughs> Hashtag dumb. Um, unfortunately, you didn't get that one right either, Chris. Dave was right. It was Josh Koscheck, uh Standing oh, there oh. looking looking like a supreme douche. Just, Hi. Uh, with his little plaid shirt there. So, Patrick wins his second win. Congratulations, buddy. Uh, Ooh, making it making it closer. 5-4. Team MMA Podcast still has the lead, but uh, only by by one. Maybe maybe on our next show we'll see Team MMA Mental tie it up at five. And, uh, yeah, oh, we'll definitely... You know, we you know how we do, son. And uh, we'll definitely be keeping tags on Team MMA Podcast who are honorary members Ramses and Team MMA Mental, who has the honorary member of Dave. Um, yeah, Ray, Ray, Dave, and Chris with one win. Patrick getting in the multiple wins section with me. He has two, I have four. Uh, and let's, yeah. let's move on. Let's move on oh, and break down. Second. What? Wait, but before, oh, can I just say, I'd like to dedicate that victory to Pat Victory Barry. speech. Because he... he he follows me on Twitter as well as I follow him. Us Pat's got to stick together. So he hooked me up with some points on that one. Shouts out to HD. I'm going to fucking rape your mouth, Patrick. Oh, hey, oh, we're, we're, we're getting real on the MA podcast. You know what? I need some Duke Nukem drops for that. That's, that's what we need. That's the only retort I, I can. I'd just like to point out that the guy that asked me if I was in the guys just uh, said he was going to put his dick in some other per- man's mouth. <laughs> when did I say I was going to do that? Didn't you say you said something earlier? You, you, wait, I said wait, I was going to eat. I uh, said oh I was going to eat Chris's little butt. But uh, let Ooh, us move on. Jesus. Let us move on. Um, UFC on Fox is going to be an awesome card. We got five prelim fights we want to talk about. Four main card fights. For the five prelim fights, we're going to go rapid fire. Try and keep it to ten to fifteen seconds. Just really quick. Who do you have and why? We'll start off with Scott Jorgensen versus John Albert. I have Jorgensen just because he's fought more top-level guys. I love Albert. He was on our first show, but i got to go with Young Guns. I'll tell you what, man. John Albert is a fantastic fighter, but I've got Scott Jorgensen's second-round submission. First round will be close. Second round, it's all Scotty Jorgensen. Uh, I didn't even know this fight was going down. Apparently, it, it it's one of those dark matches that happens on Facebook. Uh, it should be, if MySpace was still around, it'd be the MySpace prelims. Um, but I'll pick Scott Jorgensen in this one. Uh, just because John Albert is just, uh, I really, I can't remember who the fuck he fought last. So, But I can remember Scott Jorgensen. He's fought some title guys. 
I'm also going with Spotty Jorgensen. Um, you know, I just think he's the better fighter in this one. Uh, kind of like to agree with Ramsey. I can't remember who Elber fought last either. So, yeah, Spotty Jorgensen. I'm going to go with the upset pick myself. I'm going with John Albert. Uh, not just because steel. he was on the podcast, but I really do like his skill set. I do think he's got uh, some good boxing. He does have some good ground game in spite of, you know, the couple setbacks he's he's faced. Um, you know, losses to Ivan Menjivar and this Eric El Goito Perez kid. He looks like a phenom, especially coming off that uh, that huge knockout. Um, but yeah, I like I like Albert's skill set. I'm going to go with him for the upset. I like Albert, and I'd like Albert to win. But I think this is a fight to get Jorgensen back in the win column after being being beaten in his last fight against Wineland. So I'm thinking Jorgensen goes out and controls Albert for a 15 minute decision. Definitely. Moving on, uh, top featherweight contender Dennis Seaver taking on Nam Fan. I was really kind of scratching my head when this one was made because Seaver is easily in the top five of the featherweights. Nam Fan, I don't even think, is in the top 20. Uh, he definitely is good, but not that good. Seaver's beaten a lot of top lightweights, and uh, yeah, I see him beating Nam Fan. Oh, man. Uh, I got to go with Nam Pham, I guess, because the Vietnamese have been on a on a little win streak here with Kung Lee just knocking the hell out of Rich Franklin. I bet Nam Pham is going to feed a little bit off of that. Um, so hopefully he'll take the win. Uh, yeah, Dennis Sieber, he's kind of getting old. And Nam Pham's actually a cool guy if you hear him talk. You know, personally, I do like Nam Pham. He's been guest multiple times on the uh, podcast. But I think Seaver's going to be too much for him to handle. I think Seaver's going to get the one possibly by knockout. Yeah, this is a really, really tough fight to call. Um, I mean, I, I say that about every fight, though. But uh, I got to go with Dennis Seaver. And? For me, this, for me, this isn't a tough fight to call. I think uh, Dennis Seaver's uh, last fight was a win over Diego Nunes. And I look at Nunes, look at Nam Fan. And for me, Nam Fan's a massive step down in competition. As much as I like Nam Fan, and I've interviewed Nam Fan, he's a, he's a nice guy. But I think Dennis Seaver will just, will just stick and move and out, out point him for 15 minutes to get a decision. Dennis Seaver fought Andre Winner about two years ago and got tagged in that fight and choked out um, the man who had the faster hand speed in Andre Winner. Nam Fan has a better ground game, so I don't see Dennis Seaver being able to choke him out. Judging on that, I got Dennis Seaver split decision. All right, moving on, we got Darren Crookshank versus Henry Martinez. Kind of funny. Both of the guys who are on our first episode, Albert and Crookshank, are fighting on this prelim card. Uh, I didn't give the podcast love to Albert, but I'm giving it to Crookshank, and I think he wins this fight. I remember that podcast with Christian down there. Definitely a good guy. Funny as all hell. Um, I kind of like him better than Martinez in this one. So, yeah, Christian by decision. Yeah, Christian, he's a good guy. Uh, got to interview him a couple times, different podcasts. Um, but, man, I like Henry Martinez. He's a, He looks like a good dude. So I'm going to take him. I like Christian. This For me, this is a difficult fight to pick. Because Martinez looked good at welterweight when he fought Riddle. I know he lost the fight, but he did look good. But Kukshank uh, has got some good striking, and I'm thinking he can keep the fight standing and pick him apart. I don't think he'll get the stoppage, but I think he'll get I'm saying it a lot now, but I think again he'll win a decision. But I'm going to go for Kukshank. Henry Martinez has that uh, ability to recover from damage, which we've seen against Riddle. Kukshank is a better version of Riddle, whereas they're kind of equally... Uh, strength-wise, the same thing, and he has a better striking game. He's also preparing for the zombie apocalypse, so I got Darren Crookshank, unanimous decision. Yeah, it looks like we're all agreeing on Darren, um, uh, even though I just want to say I'm, I'm probably the only person that hasn't interviewed him or anything, so I'm not biased at all when I'm picking him. Uh, he is going to win. Uh, he, word, word on the street is that he's going to go for the zombie kill bonus, all right? So Darren Crookshank, he's going to win by a capoeira kick that decapitates Henry Martinez just to make sure he stays dead. Damn, some <laughs> s- strong words. Uh, a couple more. Uh, 
I do apologize, ladies and gentlemen, but one hour and 25 minutes into the show, my computer decided to shut down. It overheated. Uh, I was able to get it turned back on. And when I rejoined the conversation, they were talking about Eve Edwards versus Jeremy Stevens. And we rejoined them at that moment in the conversation. Can't remember his name. So he does have that ground game. He struggled against like top level grapplers before. He had actually had a three fight losing streak where he lost by submission in the second round, uh, guillotines as well as rear naked chokes. So uh, that should tell you something that he has that hole in his game. Mike Swick is a really, really good guillotine guy, and he's super quick, and he has fantastic boxing as well as an aggressive finishing style. So it's two aggressive guys going head on head, and uh, let's look at track records. Mike Swick came back and had a successful, you know, re-debut against uh, Demarcus Johnson pretty recently here. And after that, I would have to lean towards Matt Brown. I see Matt Brown just kind of beating the shit out of Mike Swick after that first round and getting a third round stoppage. I worked with a guy uh, named Matt Brown once. I bet. I- Sure, we've all worked with or went to school with a guy named Matt Brown at some point in our lives, and I and if if I were to see him in a lineup, I couldn't pick him out. Um, I don't, you know, he's a forgettable fighter, is what I'm getting at. At the end of the day, um, I don't I don't remember who his last couple fights were with, uh, but Mike Swick is a name guy. It's going to be a brawl. I know that Matt Brown has some good uh, some good jits, or at least he used to. He's kind of uh, getting into his. Uh, a little bit past his prime if he ever had one. That's the thing. He never had a prime. Um, but Mike Swick's been doing awesome. So uh, Mike Swick's going to kill him. Yeah, um, it's tough. kind of a tough fight for me. Uh, Swick's been out of the game for a while, then comes back, gets a fast knockout win, looks great. Uh, Matt Brown, you know, he's just that, that gritty old veteran. He's been around for a long time. Uh Tough fight. We've seen Matt Brown get tossed around by Wonder Boy for a while, but then he gassed horribly, and Brown came back to Storm and won victory. Or I don't know if he won by decision or just subbed him late. I think he won decision. Um, for the hell of it, I'm just going to say Swick's going to get the finish late in the fight. Yeah, Matt Brown, he's a tough dude to finish. I think Mike Swick it could definitely be the guy to do that job. I've loved both of these guys since they came out. They both were products of the Ultimate Fighter system. Of course, Mike Swick, he was on the first season. Um, They've always been exciting fighters. I remember Matt Brown, his first fight on the Ultimate Fighter, or one of his first fights on the Ultimate Fighter TV show, he front kicked this dude right in the face. Couldn't tell you the dude's name. Um, And he, he always brings it when he comes to fight. I just think Mike Swick is a little better in all areas of the fight. And I think Demarcus, uh, or I'm sorry, I think Mike Swick looked okay in his debut or his re-return in almost two years out fighting Demarcus Johnson. But um, I think he'll come back looking even better now. He's got that ring rust out of the way. Hopefully he's feeling better in training. And I think he'll come out, and I think he can definitely get the finish against Matt Brown. The dude's name was Jeremy May. And the reason I remember is uh, what I remember from the show, but we, we interviewed Matt. Brown on the podcast uh, and Jeremy May was one of these guys a bit like uh, Junie Brown and he just talked so much shit and wound everyone up and I oh, asked yeah. Matt Brown what it, what, it, what it was like to kick him in the head and he said it was it was brilliant and I think Dana White called it one of the coolest knockouts he's ever seen but uh, yeah back, sorry back back to this fight I, I like Matt Brown and they're saying about his fights being forgettable I have to disagree I mean I thought his fight with Stephen Thompson was pretty good pretty back and forth fight and Matt Brown's one of those guys that they bring in and they feed him to people as a gimme fight and he, and he upsets the apple cart. He did it with Stephen Thompson. He did it with even going back to when he fought James Wilkes. James Wilkes was the tough nine winner and he was, they brought him over to the UK to lose to James Wilkes and he battered James Wilkes. So I think Matt Brown shouldn't be underestimated. I think this is going to be a really tough fight for, uh, for Swift. I think it's going to go back and forth and I think it'll go the distance, but I think Swift will do just enough to win by decision. But Brown's definitely not an easy fight. Yeah, you know, Swick was kind of on on top of his game, riding high there in 08 and 09. Then he lost those two fights to Dan Hardy and Paulo Tiago and took over two years off, took a lot of time off. 
Um, I think he was going through a lot of shit with, you know, going to Thailand. Uh, he had a little spat with Tiger Muay Thai, if I believe so. Um, Tiger and Blood. A, Tiger Blood. And, you know, Brown is really impressive. Looked awesome against Wonder Boy. You know, put, put Wonder Boy on his ass and just gr- grinded on him. But he also has a lot of questionable losses on, on his record, sort of like Swick. But I do think when it comes down to it, Swick's going to take the fight. Um, A, because of just, you know, the, the, the time Swick took off seemed to really invigorate him. He had a very impressive KO victory versus Demarcus Johnson in August. And, uh, yeah, I think we have a reinvigorated Swick, and he's going to win similar to this Penn McDonald fight. We have a reinvigorated BJ Penn. Uh, Ramsey said he thought it was fake. Since has reneged on his comments, uh, agreed that, that it is a real video. BJ Penn looks like he's in excellent shape for the fight. Roy McDonald's going to be a, in a world of hurt. BJ Penn's been training his ass off, bringing top guys in to train with him in Hawaii. And I not not only am picking BJ Penn, I'm picking BJ Penn first round, first minute knockout. Yes. <laughs> well, I have to wish that I wish this podcast were on Friday nights because honestly, the BJ Penn versus Rory McDonald. If the question is who you got, it I can't pick it until I see BJ at the weigh-ins tomorrow. Unfortunately, I have to see which BJ is going to show up. That's what it all depends on. It doesn't, like I said, it doesn't matter who BJ ever fights. Um, it just depends on which BJ Penn shows up that night. If if it's a BJ Penn is motivated and fighting fighting for the right reasons, he's going to win nine times out of ten out of whoever they put him up against. Um, so if he shows up, he cut the weight early. I did verify it was legit. Uh, no, no photoshopping or video editing. It, it, no conspiracy there. BJ Penn lost the weight early. Uh, uh, let's hope he kept it off, didn't fuck it up, stayed disciplined, and that he's going to come back here. That like a true comeback, not not a not a you got to go back, you know, because because your bank your bank accountant called and he he broke it down for you, son. Uh, you know, I hope it's a true comeback. If it is for BJ Penn, he will win. But if Rory McDonald, this is a five rounder, right? If if Rory McDonald wants to take it there, and BJ's not ready to go there, BJ is going to get beaten up. Uh, not as bad as last time. So uh, that's three round a three rounder. Okay, then in in that case, um, if it goes the distance, McDonald's going to get the decision. It's gonna, all he has to do is just make BJ look all beat, beaten up and bloated with a couple jabs. Um, but uh, BJ Penn, if he shows up ready to roll for real, um, a comeback, not a go back, then BJ Penn all the way. But like I said, I got to see him at the weigh-ins tomorrow, so it's too close to call. Too fucking close. You know, what Rams is bringing up the point of waiting to see tomorrow at the weigh-ins, I myself tend to wait on who I think is going to win same way for a lot of fights and this one will be another one you got to look to see how he really looks come the day before the fight um you know we already seen it through that video that he does look pretty jacked but you know you always get that fuel the feel for the fight better when you guys these two guys stand to stare down the day before the fight kind of gives you a little bit better perspective and you know how these guys look and who's really going to be ready for this fight um you know about a month ago, I was all worried McDonald's going to win this, no problem. Uh, but this past month, BJ's definitely swayed me quite a bit uh, with the way he's talking about this fight. You know, we do hear the same old thing from him. He's recommitted, blah, blah, blah. But this time, it really seems like it. Um, he hasn't really given much said if he's back for good or this is just a one-off for him. I kind of hope he's back for good and it's going to keep going. Actually, no, I'm going to take that back because I watched that UFC uh, Road to the Octagon this weekend after football Sunday, and he said that you know he feels like he's entering his prime right now. Uh, so it does seem like he is actually back for good. So I'm always happy to hear that. Um, you know, the more I was thinking about the fight, I we all know BJ Penn's great on the ground, so chances are Roy McDonald's will take it there. The guy bends like a damn pretzel, so who knows? He might be able to pull off some slick ass moving. Wrap Rory up and get him in a freaking choke and make him tap. You never know. Um, right now, I'm kind of definitely siding on BJ Penn. 
this uh this is gonna be such a great fight bj penn he's a true legend in the sport and i I truly do love hearing everybody pick bj right now um i I, i've been saying it that bj definitely has all the tools to beat rory mcdonald i have no question he can knock rory mcdonald out he could outbox him for sure uh rory mcdonald was getting outboxed by chain mills and I, I truly, you know, not to go with MMA math, but I, I really believe BJ Penn, he just has what it takes. He could get inside and he could crack that jaw. And um, I'm really hoping it goes like Jake predicts with that first minute knockout. Um, the only thing is that makes me hesitate. I think with BJ Penn, the thing is he has to win with that first minute knockout at 170. Uh, we've seen BJ Penn come in real jacked for lots of fights. He came in and jacked for a second fight with George St. Pierre. He came in jacked for, you know, a lot of fights. But the thing is, do we want a jacked BJ Penn? Because as we all know, the more muscle mass you got, the more oxygen that requires, you know, that could be a factor as to why BJ prime or apparently doesn't have the cardio for 170. So I'd really love to see BJ Penn fight at 155. I just, I don't know if it'll work out for him at 170. I think I have to get the job done quick against Rory McDonald. I think he can do it. Um, God, this is a this is a gun to my head call. Um, I'm going BJ Penn. I think Penn at 100 percent doesn't fight lightweight. Penn at 100 percent fights lightweight. You know, and for me, Rory McDonald's going to be a very similar style to to GSP. And I don't care how bendy BJ Penn is. If Rory McDonald gets Penn down on his back. He's going to unleash uh, ground and pound that is just going to brutalise Penn. And I think he'd actually, he could actually stop Penn, just like GSP did. I know the fight's not as long. But, yeah, I think the biggest difference in this fight isn't the skill set of the two guys. It's going to be the size difference. But we saw what Warren McDonald did to Nate Diaz. Now, Nate Diaz is, is obviously a top fighter at lightweight. But you put a top fighter at lightweight against a top fighter at welterweight, and then the, the, the welterweight's going to, going to beat, beat the crap out of the lightweight. And I think that's going to happen again. I think he'll rag BJ Penn. He'll get him down, and he'll beat him up and probably get a late stoppage via TKO. I'm going to keep it really simple for this breakdown. We have natural talent versus raw talent. We have an old lion versus a young buck. And my heart says BJ Penn, but my gut says uh, Rory McDonald. And I'll just keep it at that. Definitely. And kind of for all six guys in those top three fights, whether it's Penn, McDonald, Gustafson, Hua, Benson Henderson, Nate Diaz, all of these fights are career-defining fights for for each guy. Um, yeah. And, and to stick on the Penn McDonald fight, where where does this put the uh, winner in the welterweight division? Um, you know how how close is the winner of Penn McDonald going to be to that title shot? Hmm. Uh, if BJ wins, I don't think anyone's going to really give him the, uh, is he really going to come back for another title run? I, I don't see that happening. I mean, it would be, that would be a little too WWF for me. I don't know about you guys. It, it'd be a little too much. They'd have to gift wrap it and, and serve it up to him. Um, but, uh, if Rory McDonald can beat a legend, like uh, one of and here you go, BJ, one of the greatest of all time, BJ Penn. If Rory McDonald can beat him and look good doing it, um, that's gonna earn him a lot of fucking street cred. Of course, I don't know about you, but Rory McDonald's gonna earn a lot in my book. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna refer to him as you know now I'm gonna remember him as the guy that beat the shit out of BJ Penn if he wins. Um, but uh, as far as going to title shots, no, 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 they're not. None of them are both there yet this is just a fight that the fans want to see uh you know that they put it together it's a, it's a, it's a novelty fight because it's bj's comeback and you know you never know with bj uh but title shots no we're not we're not that close to that yet i don't i don't them no i'm gonna have to agree with Ramsey there and say that neither guy is deserving title shot whoever gets the win uh mcdonald used to actually take out a top welterweight after BJ Penn if he beats him. Um, but then again, Diaz is getting the title shot after his last win. 
uh, not including loss, kind of, from beating B.J. Penn, so you never know. But definitely not for B.J. I personally think he'll make the move since he's you know, gotten such terrific shape. I think he'll make the move back down to lightweight after this fight and start taking on the guys there again. Uh, I think it's just smarter for him to do instead of hanging around at the welterweight division. Uh, so, yeah, I, I really don't think that either guy is going to get a title shot after this. Yeah, I don't think anybody's getting a title shot after this fight. It, it definitely helps either guy's cause, uh, whoever the victor ends up being on Saturday night. Um, BJ Penn, I mean, the guy's a goddamn legend. You can't say anything about that guy. Uh, I would pick him to be just about anybody in any class, wherever he's fighting. Um, and as for Rory McDonald, you know, he he's on the come up. He's got some good victories under his belt or whatever. Um, but BJ is going to be a real test, a real tough test. And, um, you know, I, I think this puts him in title contention, but definitely not next for the title. I think if knocking out, um, Campman and knocking out Fitch and beating Koscheck doesn't put you next for the title. I don't think Pete in beating an old past it pen gets you a shot for the title. For me, this will be Penn's last fight. Uh, he'll get beat again by McDonald. And we've seen how disappointed he was after Diaz dominated him. I think uh, McDonald's going to put even more pain on him. Uh, and I think this will be it for Penn. I don't think Penn will ever cut down to lightweight again because I don't think he's got the dedication to cut down to lightweight anymore. He doesn't need it like he used to. So I don't think he will ever see him at lightweight, personally. Uh, and I think uh, McDonald will, will go on to get a title shot in the future, but I don't think he's there yet either. Uh, I wouldn't mind seeing him face Hendricks once Hendricks knocks out GSP. Man, it, it's crazy. Like, oh, let's let's. Uh, is he close to a title shot? Hell no. Not only is uh, is McDonald friends with GSP and training partner, and they said they would never fight. He's he's not even close. He he beat up Mike Pyle and Che Mills, and those guys are nowhere near a level competition. He got finished by Condit. Hell no. Uh, BJ hasn't really earned his keep at welterweight. He knocked out Matt Hughes pretty quick, but you know had a, a pretty Big time beating by John Fitch, so uh, I definitely don't think either of these guys are close. Yeah, yeah, and I sort of agree there. Um, as as much as I think the the winner of this fight was is you know obviously going to have overcome a tremendous challenge and you know have a career defining victory, I'd say there's still two wins away from a title shot. Uh, one one more win against an elite welterweight and then give him a title contendership fight. Um, <clears throat> So I'll uh, pass it along to Alexander Gustafson and Shogun Hua and ask the same two questions. Who, uh, who is your pick and how close is that winner to a title shot? I was actually kind of surprised when I saw Alexander Gustafson was a stiff favorite in Vegas. I don't think he's really beaten anyone that much of note other than Tiago Silva, but we don't know if Tiago Silva was on cow steroids or if, you know, he was peeing out pig's blood. Who knows? But, other than that win against Thiago Silva, yeah, he has wins against Matt, Matt Yushchenko and Hamill, and those TKOs were impressive. But Phil Davis absolutely had his way with him, first-round submission. I think who is a better fighter than Davis, and even though Gustafson's probably evolved as a fighter since then, so has Hua. Um, and, uh, yeah, Hua is a warrior. Every fight, every single fight Hua's in turns into a just all-out war. Both guys come out looking like shit in any Shogun fight, and Gustafson, I don't <laughs> think John is... John Jones. Yeah, other than, than, than John Jones. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if Gustafson can withstand the kind of war that Shogun's going to make this fight, and that's why I have Shogun. As far as the title shot goes, I mean, really, other than the, the, the winner of uh, Dan Henderson and Leota Machida... I I can't think of anyone more deserving. So, say you know, just assuming that Jones beats Sonnen and then fights the winner of Machida versus uh, Machida versus Henderson, I say put the winner of this fight uh, in into a number one con- contendership match. Uh, give him a shot. I don't know who you, who you would put him against, but uh, yeah, I think the winner would be one one fight away from a title shot. All right, well, to start it off, I'm still, you know, very torn on this fight. I really I really don't know who I'm going to pick yet. Um, personally, I think Shogun needs to just come out the gate and come swinging. 
you know, almost like a Juan Mill style at Gustafsson because, uh, you know, he's going to have that reach on Shogun and it's going to be hard for him, you know, to sit back and try to really dictate a fight with him because of that reach. I think he just has to come out the gate and just come with a fury at him. Uh, you know, either way, I think it's still going to be a good fight. Um, I'm really, really torn on who's going to win this one. So I don't have an answer there. But as for the title shot, um, you know, I still think that the Machida Henderson fight should rank above it because don't forget, Henderson was supposed to fight, but he suffered the knee injury. Um, got lost in the pack a little bit with all this chill, son and nonsense. Um, then again, we're looking at the UFC new motto, what's better for business. So who really knows who's going to get the next title shot? I, feel, I have a feeling we'll be saying this a lot until things change. But I still think that the winner of Machida Hendo should definitely be a uh, number one contender over this fight. Yeah, I, I, I can't even really speculate on to who's next, who gets the next title shot, even uh, depending on who wins this. Gustafsson, I think he's looking really good these days. Whereas Shogun, he damn near got beat by, Vran- by Brandon Vera. Um, I'm taking the young buck, Alexander Gustafsson. He does have that loss to uh, Phil Davis. I think that was a round two submission. Um, could be mistaken on that. But he's been training with Phil Davis like every day since, and he got out of some bad positions against James Tahuna, and uh, he's been destroying fools lately. Just made a quick where he retired Matt Hamill. He didn't just beat Matt Hamill. He retired Matt Hamill, and then he knocked out Vladimir Matyushenko like it was nobody's business. So um, I, I think he's just going to put hands on Shogun all night. I agree as well. I think this is Gustafsson's coming out party. I've been saying I've been saying this for a while, and I think it's very hard to compare Shogun to Phil Davis because Phil Davis beat Gustafsson because of his wrestling. I don't think Shogun's got the same caliber or standard of wrestling as what as what Phil Davis has got, or, or even the same inclination to use wrestling. He'll want to stand with Gustafsson, and I think Gustafsson will use his range and will pick him apart. I don't think he'll stop Shogun, but I think he will beat him over the distance. Uh, as regards to title shot. I think Gustafsson's going to fight for that title. I think he's one of those guys that's going to be around for a long time. He'll, he'll probably have a few title fights. I don't know if he'll going to get it yet. I think I'd like to see uh, the winner of Hendo Machida face the winner of Sonnen and Jones, which we're going to assume is Jones. But yeah, Gustafsson will fight for the title, but not yet. Man, Gustafsson is one of those guys that is uh, a huge, you know, prodigy, very tall, lanky, has an excellent striking game, pretty good defensive wrestling. And... You know, if this was two years ago, I'd say Shogun Hua would be the definite winner here. But Shogun has lost his mobility in his last two fights. He has looked absolutely plotting. As much as I hate to say it, I've got Alexander Gustafsson in this fight. Uh, it's it's a three-rounder, so Shogun can definitely survive it. But it's going to be a one-way beatdown uh, on Shogun. So i got Gustafsson, unanimous decision. Yep, um, I've got to say, I think deep down we all know, even if we're a fan of Shogun, that he has an embarrassing knockout coming up, followed by a retirement. Like, we're all just waiting for this guy to fight his last fight and retire. Every memory I have of Shogun now is of him getting punched in the face, punching some other guy in the face until they're both just... It's the same story. Everyone knows this is going to be a zombie fight, just seeing how many times... This guy can get hit in the fucking head and still be standing, just like all his other fights. But I suspect that the bad knockout is coming. Alexander Gustafson, he's just like, he's the same age as John Jones. um, Kind of the same, you know, the same kind of of body, a younger body up against Shogun. It's going to be, it's not even going to be close, just like the John Jones fight wasn't. Uh, Complete ownership by Alexander Gustafson. Unless Shogun wins by some sort of miracle, Mike Tyson, who gives a fuck hook? Um, I got to give it to Gus, Gus, definitely. Hands down. Damn, lots of Gus and love. Um, let's move on to the main event. Uh, ben Henderson versus Nate Diaz, lightweight championship. Diaz has been saying he deserves his title shot for a while. Finally gets it. It's going to be a stiff test for him, but I think the, the overwhelming factor is going to be Benson Henderson's strength. We saw Diaz, he's great at technique, great at just overloading someone with punches. I mean, Donald Cerrone, I I think he's a top five lightweight 
and he absolutely put it to Cerrone. Diaz just dominated him. Um, I don't think he's going to be able to do the same thing for for Benson Henderson. He's very, very quick, and I think just because of that strength advantage is going to be able to overwhelm Diaz and get the decision victory because of that. And as far as the future of that that title shot and who who should get who who should fight the winner, um, I I don't know if it's official, but it may as well be. I'm pretty sure the winner of Pettis versus Donald Cerrone will get that next title shot against the winner. So we'll uh, see a trilogy fight, hopefully with that Henderson Cerrone matchup. But yeah, I have Benson Henderson taking it by decision. What do you think, P Money? Well, you know your boy P-Money has to go with Nate Diaz. We've been going Diaz heavy on this episode, um, and I'm always rooting for them. I, I've been a fan of Nate Diaz ever since. The the Ultimate Fighter 5 days is when I was first introduced to him. Uh, he started off on a great run then, and he's continuing that now. He's come back better than ever since he dropped back down from welterweight. Um, he's just about, I think, like 26, 27 years old just starting to get that man strength. I think uh, they're on this new diet. They're looking much bigger in their respective weight classes. I think they've been rounding out their training a little bit better. B took Nick Diaz down more times than he took, or took John Fitch down more times than he took Nick Diaz. And Nick Diaz, everybody was saying, oh, Jim Miller's going to out-wrestle him. People were saying Cowboy Cerrone was going to out-wrestle him. They didn't do any of that. Nate Diaz has been destroying the only thing Ben Henderson can do, he can win a wrestling match, but he can't beat Nate Diaz in a fight. Nate Diaz will outbox him to hell, outgrapple him if we're talking strictly jujitsu. Um, but if Ben gets his heavy laying prey going, you know, that's about all he can do. But I'm going with the better fighter, I'm going with the bigger fighter. Uh, I think I think Ben Henderson, he's or uh, Nate Diaz, he's going to come out. He's going to finish Ben Henderson first round knockout. Damn. I think Diaz is going to win as well. I don't think he'll get a knockout, but watching Diaz fight against Cerrone and and, and Miller was just mental. Yeah, me just, uh, absolute, hey, man. Oh, this is rubbish. You two <laughs> are rubbish. Watch hey, it, I, was, watch. I was quick with it there. Come on, son. Yeah, and, and I tried quick. to catch up with him, and you did it so quick. We had like no time. Come on. I'm, I'm, you've, you're writing me a cue, and I'm, I'm reading your cue, and you're still missing your cue. It may cue. It's shocking. <laughs> right. Uh, Henderson, Mental, Ray. Henderson and Diaz was, was uh, sorry, uh, Nate Diaz against Cerrone and Jim Miller was epic. I mean, uh, it, the transformation for Nate Diaz in those two fights was unbelievable. And like uh, Jake said, I rate Cerrone really, really highly. I also rate Jim Miller really, really highly. And we've seen Jim Miller lose, but only to top-tier opponents. But we've never seen Jim, Jim Miller get submitted. And that's what Nate Diaz did. And he made Cerrone look like an amateur. I mean, he literally destroyed Cerrone. Cerrone looked like a broken Sad man. Sad day for me. Yeah, and, and Cerrone's awesome, but he didn't look awesome in that fight at all. And I just think it's Diaz's time now. I think he's going to use his boxing to outbox Henderson and to keep him at range like he does. And if Henderson goes to the ground, we know how flexible Henderson is because uh, of obviously that crazy fight before. But I think Cerrone, uh, uh, sorry, I think Diaz is capable of submitting Henderson. I've got I've got Nate Diaz all the way. Is it my turn? It's me. Yep. If her name's Chris. Okay. okay. Well, that's me then. Um, in this fight, if it goes by a decision, Ben Henderson, finish Nate Diaz. And I know that's a safe bet, but there's so many intangibles for me in this fight. I mean, Nate Diaz is a monster. Uh, his last three fights have proven that he is a beast. I mean, to completely dominate Donald Cerrone, Jim Miller, and Takano Origomi in the way that he did, fantastic, man. I'm a huge fan. But Ben Henderson is kind of turning into the uh, the lightweight version of GSP. I mean, his finishing rate's going down. He's very, very dominant, but he's not very exciting. So if it goes to a decision, obviously he's going to win. If Nate can find a way to actually pull you know, pull something together and finish him, then he wins. And as Paul far as... Henderson, not exciting, is mental. Yeah. And may mental. You're rubbish again, both <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> so who should get the next tile shot? Obviously, the winner of Pettis versus Cerrone. 
All right. Benson Henderson versus Nate Diaz. You are crazy if you bet this fight. This is a big who knows because it all depends on um, which strategy Benson Henderson is going to deploy uh, and how he looks. Uh, tomorrow at the Wayans, you know, w- w- if he shows up looking good and in shape, nothing wrong with him, um, then he's going to have a slight edge over Diaz because he just has more. Uh, he, what I'm hoping he does and the best strategy is, of course, to keep it on the feet, but to keep Nate Diaz from getting close enough to hurt him. Uh, he's got to play it safe. As much as I hate to say it and see it, at least this time we're not paying for it. Uh, at least they're not hooking us on that pay-per-view to watch a sparring match. But Benson Henderson's got to keep Nate Diaz away. And the best way to do that is to do what what the Cowboy Cerrone did to Diaz, which was kick the shit out of his legs. Uh, just keep knocking him out. Keep going for leg kicks, which is Benson Henderson's. Uh, he, he's got an advantage over over Diaz's leg kicks. I got to say, and he'll be able to push him away, hurt him, keep keep Diaz away from hurting him. And if he manages to do that, if he employs that strategy, which which uh, it's straight out of the you see the Dave Chappelle or the Murphy the Charlie Murphy story where they beat the shit out of uh, Rick James's legs on the couch. That's what that's what Benson Henderson has to do to Nate Diaz in order to win Murphy. Fight. Fuck He's your couch. Beat the shit out of those legs, yeah. and then he'll fucking win. So um, I'm not gonna call it. It is too close. It is it's too much of a squeezer. That was a pretty good one, guys. Uh, but too much of a squeezer. Too close to call for me. Who should get the next title shot? Um, looks like uh, looks like uh, Bettis, bro. It looks like it doesn't matter, man. Didn't Dana White just call it earlier, supposedly? It looks like Diaz gets a – or sorry, sorry. Um, no, no. The, the, <laughs> the, the, You're so, such a I'm, mook, dude. What a I'm mook. so mixed up and high. Come on. You know, the Nog brothers, who can tell them apart? What know? a mook. Oh, and then Nick gets the next towel shot at lightweight. Oh, wait a second. <laughs> When these when these when these brothers these Nog brothers these Diaz brothers I don't even eh, God damn it all right sorry I'm high you I told you guys I was lighting up a couple minutes ago now you're seeing that transformation but um who should get the next title shot yeah. uh, Ben look this is such a who knows let's just see what happens and then go from there but Benson Henderson slight edge yeah um I think. Personally, I think that Nate Diaz could pull off the win. Uh, Dendo really hasn't fought a guy like Nate Diaz, in my opinion. Um, it's going to be tough. Eh? If he fights like the way he's fought his past couple of fights at light heavyweight with his reserve, uh, with his uh, newfound love for fighting and his uh, drive to win, Benderson, Benderson, Bendo's going to be in a lot of trouble. Uh, got Ramsey's but babbling now, it's got me all babbling. But, uh, you know, it, it's, Nate has a superior boxing. Uh, we've seen what could happen with Henderson with, with a boxer and Frankie Edgar in those two fights. You know, now he's fighting a much bigger guy than Frankie Edgar. Uh, that that distance is really going to hurt. But uh, Ramsey probably go playing with those leg kicks like the Cerrone fight. Uh, we all know that Bendo has legs like a freaking running back in the NFL. So I definitely think he could throw some more damage, way more damage than Cerrone was throwing at him. But at the end of the day, though, look what happened to Cerrone's face, you know, from the boxing aspect of Nate Diaz. So if Bendo wants to sit there and throw those all day, look what happened to his face in return. Um if the fight goes to this, I still think that Nate could pull off the win. Um, you know, he's slick us all off his back, just like Bendo is. I re- a lot of people are bringing up, you know, well, Benerson's that wrestling guy, and Nate has trouble with wrestling guys. But, you know, that was Nate Diaz from a couple years ago. This is completely new Nate Diaz. I really think that he's going to pull it off. Um, I don't think he'll finish uh, Henderson because he's a tough guy to finish. I think he's only about subbed once in his whole entire career. Um, so if he does win, it will be by decision. Uh, next title shot, I would definitely hit the save Cerrone Pettis winner. Definitely, um, <clears throat> all uh, all very good picks, and I guess that wraps up our topic. So before we send it out, Ray, you want to shout out the Fight Busters one more time? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, so I've got three. I've got three fighters. They are all fighting on either UFC on FX FX six or the Top of Sixteen finale which is obviously not this weekend, the weekend after. If you, There is a prize to win if you, if you, can know, if you know the answers. 
and the uh, the prize is a uh, is from our sponsors UK Fightwear. It's a blue dethrone hat. Um, you can either tweet us at MMA Mentor or at uh, the MMA Podcast, and or you can email MMA Mentor at hotmail dot com. And the three clues are a robot sleeping in a car, which is clue number one. Clue number two, singing in Brazil. And clue number three has to be a female playing on the swings. And if you think you know the answers to those, tweet us at MMA Mentor or at the MMA Podcast. We do it every Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. It is the round table. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, Follow us on Twitter at VMA Podcast. We'll let you know about next week's episode. Moving back to Florida. uh, And I uh, know a lot of you guys can't do a different day. So we'll uh, definitely keep you updated whether we change it next Monday or just skip next week. Um, Ray, you want to shout out MMA Metal one more time before I send it off? MMA Metal. MMA Metal. Yeah, we had to... Yeah, we had to... I thought I might have been on mute there. We had a good couple of guests on last uh, last night. We had we spoke to two of the the top UK uh, lightweight prospects. So we uh, the first guest up was the number one contender for both Bama and KSW in Poland, uh, uh, and it was Kurt Warburton who was who has fought in the UFC. He went one and two in the UFC, and we also sp- spoke to Tough Smash's contestant and standout contestant uh, Brent. And, lock, lock name, and that he was great to chat with. He was he was very forthcoming, very good interview. Talked to us. We talked about quite a few things, including the the incident with the phone in the house, which was quite interesting. So yeah, ch- uh, check that out. And next week we're doing a new uh, uh, we're doing our second series of fight diaries, uh, and we'll be doing it with Rich Rare Breed Hale on the build up to his Bellator heavyweight tournament fight, which should be very very exciting. Definitely. Um, I haven't listened to this week's episode yet, but I'm going to make sure to get to that. Um, <clears throat> our own podcast. I'm going to be posting up that Corey interview tonight. Go and check it out if if you haven't. I truly think it was our best interview. Um, and it wasn't and it wasn't uh, because of me at all. It was all all him. Uh, he's a very very intelligent guy, and I'd ask him a simple question, and he would have this really long intricate answer about it. A uh, really cool guy to talk to. Chatted with us for 90 minutes. Really looking forward to having him on again. Uh, so yeah, the MA podcast every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Like I said before, round table every Thursday, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Uh, Dave, Ramsey's, Chris, Pat, Ray, you guys are awesome round tableists, and as are you, the listener, for tuning in. And until the next show, we go. Uh, before we go, we've got some out oh. for you, Patrick. Patrick. Yeah, you know what? Uh, just want to also shout out. Nam fan, like we talked about, he's got that fight coming up on UFC on Fox 5 this weekend. Uh, he was good enough to give me a little interview with him last night. We got that posted up on the MMA Playground blog and the MMA Playground news forum. He talks to us about uh, the short notice fight and uh, his his time in the fight game. Definitely. Check it out, y'all. Um, so, we good? <laughs> We're good. We're good. We good. Shouts, shouts out done. We good. We gone. We gone. We're 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 gone. we are gone we you need to join the playground, Ramsey. Jesus Christ. I tried looking at that, but it's all confusing. I don't know. I, I just took it to Twitter. Uh, it's me on. Sorry. Oh, you gotta do it. You gotta do it. Well, gentlemen, it's been fun. Nope. Can't do it. <laughs> oh, nice. Come on.